councillors please stand. Almighty God, we the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open. Are there any apologies? Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I advise that Councillor Cunningham will be absent today and I move that she be granted a leave of absence from the meeting. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that Councillor Cunningham be granted a leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Any other apologies? Confirmation of minutes, please. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,651st meeting held on Tuesday, 8 June 2021, be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that the minutes of the 4,651st meeting of Council held on the 8th of June 2021 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Councillors, uh, I draw to your attention question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor? Point or of order, a Chair. Point of order. Uh, let me finish and then I'll call your point of order. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or a Chair of any of the standing committees? It's a point of order called while I was speaking. Councillor Cassidy. Oh, thank you very much, Chair. I move suspension of standing orders to allow me to move the following urgency motion. That Brisbane City Council reinstate curbside collection in the 2021-2022 Council budget. Second. I have an urgency resolution proposed by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Strunk. Uh, I trust that's been distributed, <coughs> Councillor Cassidy. Uh, yes, it thanks, will be Chair. in Councillor's um, inboxes in a moment. Just please wait on while we reset your clock to zero. Please proceed three minutes. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. And this is an important issue for the people of Brisbane, and it's a bit disappointing uh, that all those LNP councils on the other side thought uh, that basic services in our community are a bit of a joke, or cutting those basic services in our community are a bit of a joke for the LNP. But this is urgent today, Chairs. This is the last council meeting, the last ordinary council meeting we have before the Lord Mayor hands down his budget. And it's important for elected representatives to say that this is an important issue, that this Lord Mayor now has less than 24 hours to right his wrong uh, and to swallow his pride, admit he got it wrong, uh, and he should never have cut this vital community service. Uh, opposition councillors have spent the last year campaigning alongside residents of Brisbane Chair, demanding that this basic service come back. And when those residents know that that service that costs $6.5 million costs the same amount as this Lord Mayor's advertising budget, they get yeah. angry, Chair. Councillor Cassidy, you're making substantive points rather than uh, procedural ones. Can you please return to urgency? Over 6,000 people have signed petitions calling for this to come back, Chair. We've had, uh, this is the 13th opportunity now uh, for this council to debate this matter uh, and to make a decision and call on this Lord Mayor to bring back curbside collection. Uh, we'll wait and see, but I assume the LNP will be true to form. Once, once again, uh, and I they'll vote you, again can I ask you to return to, to urgency, They'll vote please. again not to bring back curbside collection, Chair. This is urgent because the streets of Brisbane have become lined with rubbish, Chair. Uh, and this is all a result of the political decision that this Lord Mayor made. Point of order, Point of order to you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Cassidy is misleading the Chamber about what this is about. He's talking about we, the substantive issue, not the thank urgency. Thank you, but that's, that's, we no longer recognise a point of order. Um, but I, I will uh, call Councillor Cassidy to return to the matter of urgency rather than the substantive argument, please. Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. This is urgent, and it's urgent because the streets of Brisbane are becoming lined with garbage. We know after this Lord Mayor made that decision, that political decision to cut curbside collection, we saw a massive spike in illegal dumping, and then we saw a massive spike in the number of fines that were issued to residents of Brisbane, and they were never told that curbside collection was being Councillor slashed Cassidy, by this again, Lord this Mayor. Once again, this is a substantive argument, not an urgent argument, please, to urgency. Chair, it is vitally urgent that the Lord Mayor brings back curbside collection in tomorrow's budget. I will now put the urgency resolution. On the matter of urgency, all those who support urgency, please say aye. aye. And those against, please say no. Aye. The noes have it. Division. Division is called Seconded. by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Griffiths. Please ring the bells.
All councillors are present. We will proceed to a vote. All those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being seven in favour, 19 against. The noes have it. The matter has been determined to not be urgent. Can I also recognise this is uh, the clerk to my right's debut in this role, and that's her debut reading the vote. So welcome <laughs> to the team. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. All right. Uh, questions? Are there any questions? Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor McLaughlin, Council's parking meters are soon to be going paperless with receipts soon to be delivered electronically. What are the benefits of e-receipting at parking meters? Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair, and through you, I thank Councillor Hutton for the question. I'm glad to be able to update the Chamber on another Schrinner Council initiative that keeps sustainability and system improvement at the forefront of our operations while producing an enhanced service for parking metre customers. Mr Chair, Council maintains just over 900 parking metres servicing nearly 8,000 parking metre spaces citywide. Introducing e-receipting will reduce, reduce the cost of maintenance through simplifying the mechanical hardware needed and reducing both scheduled and reactive servicing. The removal of paper receipting on those little scraps of thermal paper will extend the life of the parking metres by up to five years through removing hardware in the boxes needed to provide paper receipts and limiting the repairs needed for things like paper jams. These days, a receipt displayed on the dashboard isn't needed to show that the parking session has been paid for, but customers may need one for reimbursement from the boss or for tax purposes, and e-receipts will be much better for record keeping, better than the old shoebox method. Um, Mr Chair, getting your e-receipt will be an easy process with several options available using the new kinds of technology and infrastructure that we're all now used to, like the QR code scanning, a process which won't be dissimilar from the check-ins that we all have to do now at restaurants. Customers who use the Cello Park app will see no change. The Cello Park payment application will remain as is. Parking meter customers will be able to scan the QR code on the meter to submit their details through the prompts provided. The alternative to the QR code will be for, customer, for a customer to access the website using the code displayed on the parking meter along with vehicle registration and a receipt will be sent to the email address provided. Now, if a customer doesn't have a smartphone, computer access or email address, they can call the council call centre to have a receipt sent to them. While the likelihood of a paying customer getting an infringement is small, Council has a system in place to ensure that customers can appeal an infringement when they have paid for their parking without downloading a receipt. And if there is a dispute, by calling the Council call centre and providing personal details, car registration, meter number or parking zone and time of the parking session, Council will send out the correlating receipt to support the appeal of an infringement. Mr Chair, extending the life of parking metres by reducing their complexity directly benefits ratepayers as we've been able to suspend the need for the procurement of new payment systems for the time being. In February this year, Council finalised phasing out coin payments at Council parking metres, instead promoting the use of contactless payment methods through the surcharge free tap and go or by using the Seller Park app. Of this change, Mr Chair, was in response to several significant factors. First, a drop of cash payments from 22% in 2017 to only 6% in 2021. And cashless payments also improved hygiene, something we're all conscious of now in the COVID-19 recovery, particularly in relation to and regard to using cash everywhere. Like any change, Mr Chair, this move to e-receipting will require some adjustment from drivers who regularly use metered parking. This is why from the 21st of June, phase one of the transition to electronic receipts will start, with e-receipts being made available for those who wish to receive receipts electronically. Phase two will be rolled out in September. 
when the option for paper receipts will no longer be available. In the meantime, Council will be widely advertising these upcoming changes to alert those who use metered parking. Uh, Mr Chair, e-receipting is yet another way the Shrinner Council is investing in new technology, saving ratepayer dollars and promoting new and better systems for us all to use. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Brisbane City Council has a proud history of getting its buses built right here in Brisbane, supporting local jobs for around three decades. But now under this LNP Lord Mayor, we see the death of local bus manufacturing in Brisbane. He'd rather send those jobs to China than support jobs here in Brisbane. Last week, someone said the following about electric buses made locally by an Australian manufacturer. And I quote, they have produced an electric bus which is the most efficient in the world, 30% more efficient than a bus out of China, 30% more efficient than any bus in the world. Now that's the type of manufacturing right here in New <coughs> South Wales. Anyone want to guess who that was? The New South Wales Transport Minister, Andrew Constance. The Liberals down south get it. They understand the importance of local jobs. The Labor state government here in Queensland does as well. They're trialling Australian-built electric buses right now. Lord Mayor, why do you care more about jobs in Beijing than in Brisbane? Lord Mayor. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, through you to Councillor Cassidy for the question. Uh, well, Councillor Cassidy has been deliberately misrepresenting this issue now for some time, um, because I distinctly remember when uh, this matter came to the Council for a vote last year. Um, and uh, he's only just cottoned on to it in recent times because he thought he can uh, appeal to his union mates. Uh, what we have done is got four buses as part of a trial. Now, the size of our bus fleet is over 1,200 buses. Normally, we acquire or build uh, 60 buses a year. So this kind of suggestion that somehow um, our bus manufacturing has been outsourced is simply false. Simply false. We are leasing as part of a trial for buses. And so uh, I think Councillor Cassidy needs to focus on the facts rather than the political rhetoric here. Now, I don't know what Councillor Cassidy has against China or Beijing. Uh, he's mentioned a number of times in this place uh, derogatory and negative statements uh, that relate to China. Now, uh, I would have thought that Councillor Cassidy would take a more mature approach than that, uh, but I'm sorely disappointed. The reality is 99%, 99% of the world's electric buses are manufactured in China right now. And what we're seeing uh, in the Australian industry is that uh, our uh, manufacturers are gearing up with very small numbers of buses. Now uh, we've seen single bus trials occurring or very small numbers of buses uh, involved in trials that are involved with local manufacturing. And now we were open to that. We were absolutely open to that. And our tender process allowed that. We deliberately went out to local manufacturers to make sure that they had the opportunity to fulfil our tender requirements. But they weren't able to meet those requirements in the tender process. As I've said before, does that mean they won't be able to meet them going forward? No, not at all. It simply means that at the time we ha made the decision on the trial of four buses uh, that the local manufacturers weren't able to meet Council's requirements. That doesn't mean anything about what will happen in the future. Uh, but I have to say uh, those new buses are on the street and they are fantastic. They are absolutely fantastic. And not only do we see the benefits of having uh, zero tailpipe emissions, a quiet ride, a smooth ride, but also we see uh, one of my favourite aspects of that vehicle is the digital display inside the vehicle which shows you uh, what the next stop is and how many minutes away that next stop and it constantly updates as the bus travels around the network. This is something that could be a game changer 
This is something uh, that I'm looking forward to seeing going forward. And Councillor Cassidy may well criticise the technology we're using, uh, but at this point in time, it is the world leading technology. So I look forward to working with local manufacturers to make sure that they can meet our city's requirements. I look forward. Uh, councillors, please allow the Lord Mayor to be heard in silence. I look forward uh, to uh, making sure that we have the local capacity here so that uh, local manufacturers can meet those requirements. But obviously, at this point in time, uh, there are only very small numbers of locally built buses uh, being trialled, and those locally built buses are not yet um, up to the mass production standards that we've seen uh, that I mentioned in other parts of the world, specifically uh, with the Chinese buses, which supply 99 per cent of the world's electric bus market. And so uh, that is actually a far higher percentage than the world's mobile phone market. And in fact, I think uh, the Chinese market supplies about 70 or 80 per cent of the world's mobile phones. And I think every single councillor in this place probably has a Chinese mobile phone. No one blinks at that. Why? Because they're actually pretty good. But no, Councillor Cassidy has to try and uh, get out the dog whistle and make this a, an issue that divides our Point community. Of order, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Um, I think from the Mayor's comment there, he's Im implying that Councillor Cassidy's had question had racist undertones, and I, I don't think that's fair or reasonable, and I invite the Mayor to consider <laughs> withdrawing. Well, Thank, thanks, Councillor Shree. Look, um, OK, I'll take the point of order, um, but, but the, I will note, you know, councils will not adverse, uh, reflect, uh, reflect adversely on each other and the Lord Mayor's time has expired. Uh, I don't have further questions. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of City Planning and Economic Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, the Nathan Salisbury Maruka Neighbourhood Plan is now out for public consultation. Can you outline the proposed changes and how our ward-winning neighbourhood plan process gives residents a say in the future growth of their neighbourhoods? Councillor Adams. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hammond, for the question. And look, I'm more than happy to share what is proposed through the draft strategy for the Nathan Salisbury Maruka neighbourhood plan and the changes that have been put forward for discussion, which clearly explained on Friday morning at the launch that the officers have been working on for a while. COVID obviously put a, a bit of a dent in the time frames, but it's been over 18 months that they've been working on this and the community planning team met before that time. And this does bring an enormous opportunity for investment and renewal within the Maruka Nathan Salisbury area. But I should not be surprised at all that the local councillor from Ruka is saying apparently he caught him a little off guard, even though we've been going through this for 18 months, with a series of claims and allegations about the intentions of this plan. All I can say is that I feel like I am in Groundhog Day. I was involved in a neighbourhood plan 10 years ago where we had the local councillor out at Acacia Ridge upsetting the local community, telling them that their houses were going to be resumed, they were going to be turned into industrial factories and they would be thrown out of their lifelong right. residences, which was absolutely a furphy. It was a furphy then and it's a furphy now. And actually, it's quite ironic because now we've got the councillor saying, look out, the high residential is coming to you in an industrial zone. So it is a total 180 and extremely disappointing from the local councillor, but we are used to him deliberately misleading residents and inciting hysteria at community meetings, and I suppose I should be planned for that more in the future. And I would like to take this opportunity to clear up in the chamber today and set the record straight about this neighbourhood plan, which should really have no surprises. For a start, we went through the visions and the key themes on Friday morning, housing, employment and infrastructure. Nothing is set in stone. Again, we explained this many, many times. This is the draft strategy. But the reality, Brisbane is a growing city. 
among the fastest growing regions in Australia, and we need to be smart about how we use land going forward. And through this neighbourhood planning uh, operation and the works we go through with the community in the next six to eight months, there is an opportunity to make sure the community has their say on how we get the mix of houses and employment and livability right in these suburbs. There are better job opportunities in these areas than what we're seeing now for new and existing residents. There is more lifestyle and leisure opportunities, access to services, health care and education, but also while protecting and the look and feel of a much-loved neighbourhood, which has a lot of charm in and around these suburbs. But I shouldn't be surprised. We had the launch of the Neighbourhood Plan on Friday morning. Already, Councillor Griffith said his invitation came late, and it didn't. It came exactly the same time as everybody else's invite. The 655 Point of order. Point of invites. Councillor Griffiths. That is true. All right. That's not a point of order, but. Uh, count, count. 655. 655 invites went out to the community, residents, business owners, landowners, right across these suburbs, not a select handful, as Councillor Griffiths is claiming in the paper yesterday. And this area has been earmarked for growth for more than 10 years now under the South East Queensland Regional Plan. I had a very balanced, reasonable and, I thought, great conversation with Councillor Griffiths on Friday morning, which he made it very clear that he understood there was changes that were, uh, there was opportunities for changes and renewal in these suburbs, that there was definitely opportunities for employment around the many education areas that there are in this area, that eight storeys along the Maruka Magic Mile was not out of the realms of possibility, but he was looking forward to hearing what the community said, and I explained that. I agree totally. We explained that there's a lot of character in the, in the area, and I said, yes, I agree, Councillor Griffiths, and you'll see a lot of that come through the Heritage Advisory Committee in the coming weeks as we work through the plan as well. Actually, one step beyond that, Councillor Griffiths made it very clear to me that he'd be comfortable with character infill behind Ipswich Road as well, which I said we could definitely have a look at if he wanted to put that forward on behalf of his residents. But what we see not more than 48 hours later is a picture of Councillor Griffiths with tape across his mouth saying the usual thing he always says. They're not there to listen to you. They're just here to give you the spin. You won't have a say. The hypocrisy and the blatant difference to the conversation that I had with Councillor Griffiths on Friday morning and the hysteria he's now whipping up in the local suburbs is absolutely amazing. Councillor Adams, your time has expired. Uh, further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, recently you've been spruiking Council's new electric buses in the media and in the chamber here today. The New South Wales Liberal government has also been spruiking their new electric bus fleet. The difference, of course, is the Liberals down there are actually supporting local jobs, not deliberately snubbing them for Chinese jobs like this Lord Mayor. At every opportunity, the LNP in this Council sends jobs offshore. Every single metro vehicle is being manufactured in Europe. Now, we know the Lord Mayor's rock climbing buddy and mentor Campbell Newman prefers to send jobs offshore as well, like trains in India. So was it Campbell Newman's idea to build buses overseas or was killing off Council's bus manufacturing in Brisbane your idea, Lord Mayor? Yes. Lord Mayor. <laughs> okay, thank you uh, for the question through you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, the, the dog whistle is really out today because it's not just uh, China that he's mentioning, Campbell Newman comes up as well. And we know that when Labor has nothing, they go, they go to these low, uh, low tactics that we're seeing today. They mentioned Campbell Newman. Uh, and it, it's, there's literally not a, a week that goes by when this Labor state government doesn't mention Campbell Newman in state parliament. Yeah. And, and, and it was interesting. I saw... Um, I saw the wheel of blame come out uh, today. Councillors, councillors, councillor Strunk, please, please allow the Lord Mayor to provide his answer in silence. The Lord I Mayor. saw the wheel of blame come out today, uh, which uh, the Labor Party is well attuned to, spinning the wheel of blame. Um, and it's, you know, one week it's Canberra they're blaming, uh, next week it's councils they're blaming. They're, they blame everyone except themselves, but usually it's Campbell Newman they blame. You know what? 
He hasn't been around for quite some time. How long since uh, he left office? Six years. Six years. Yeah. Everything that happens in the state, apparently it's Campbell Newman's fault. And we see them on message today. We see them on message today. Can't help it. When they are desperate and out of ideas and looking for someone to blame, they bring up one name, and that is Campbell Newman. And so, uh, well done, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, the dog whistle has come out, and he's talking about China, and he's talking about Campbell Newman. I mean, really, is this the best that the alternative administration <coughs> for Australia's largest council can offer? Is this really the best? Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, this is very entertaining, but the Lord Mayor hasn't told us yet whether it was Campbell Newman's idea or his to oh, all these thank buses. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, Lord Mayor, please continue. <laughs> uh, well, I can assure you it wasn't Campbell Newman's idea. Uh, but what, what I can say is that going out to a competitive tender, that was my idea. Yeah. Giving local manufacturers the opportunity to bid, that was my idea. Yeah. And no, making count. sure that we actually get the latest technology, that was my idea. Um, and making sure our residents have access to clean, green, cutting edge technology, that was my idea. But uh, look, Councillor Cassidy, I know, is not interested in the facts. Uh, he just wants to make a point. He's, he's made his point. He's used the name of Campbell and he's used the word China. He's made his point. I better sit down. For further questions, Councillor Owen. Thank you. My question this afternoon is to the Chair of the Public and Active Transport Committee, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy, this week the trial of fully electric buses will commence on our City Loop route service. Can you please outline the benefits these new buses will bring and how the Shrinner Council are a national leader when it comes to a cleaner, greener and a more sustainable future for our city. <laughs> Councillor Murphy. Why, yes, I can, uh, Councillor Owen, I can. And I can tell you, uh, through you, Chair to Councillor Owen, that the Schrinner Council is absolutely dedicated to enhancing and expanding our public transport network to get more people on buses and ferries and less cars on the road. We also have a clear vision for a clean and green city as we work towards creating a more sustainable Brisbane each and every day. Now, Council's new electric bus trial that we've heard a lot about this morning is an initiative uh, that delivers on both of these priorities. Transport for Brisbane is always exploring ways to adopt a more sustainable bus fleet. And the next technology that we want to test here in Brisbane is electric buses. And just yesterday, we launched the first electric bus to operate the City Loop service on a trial basis for the next 12 months. The bus has a bright purple wrap, so you cannot miss it, making rounds of the CBD. And I know councillors have already taken a trip on it. In the next few weeks, another three electric buses will join the City Loop, routes 40 and 50, and by early July, all four buses will be in operation. Now, uh, the four electric buses have been made by Utong, which is a world leader when it comes to electric bus operations. Utong has over 100,000 electric buses operating globally, and we're very glad to be partnering with an experienced manufacturer like them to test this technology in <coughs> Brisbane's climate. Now, in recent weeks, um, and just to today, we've seen Councillor Cassidy made a number of unsubstantiated comments about the trial, and I'd like to set the record straight. Now, Council is a leader when it comes to electric transport, first with e-scooters, next with e-bikes, and of course the all-electric Brisbane Metro, and now uh, our electric e-bus trial. Now, when we went to market in 2019, we were ahead of the game, uh, and electric bus technology in Australia was just getting started. There weren't any Australian electric buses that had successfully completed a trial and entered service at that stage. Utong was the only tender that offered a proven product, and it was a responsible decision to award Utong uh, that tender, and we respect the choice. Councillor Cassidy also claimed that we're not supporting Brisbane jobs or local industry through the electric bus trial. Wrong again. Uh, Utong Australia is similar to other bus manufacturing companies in the, in the country whereby parts are imported uh, from internationally and then assembled locally. Utong Australia does have a Brisbane-based local su support network providing maintenance, training and parts supply. Utong's local distributors, Vehicle Dealers International, or uh, VDI, is a Queensland company with an office and a depot based in Brisbane at Virginia. 
VDI is completing the installation of locally sourced components for the electric buses, including seating and fire suppression from South East Queensland and Australian co companies. And this means that the electric bus trial is indeed supporting local jobs for both Utong Australia and for VDI. Now, uh, fit out of the electric buses is also supporting nine local South East Queensland uh, based supplies, which is a fantastic outcome. Um, Councillor Cassidy has not proven anything with his unfounded commentary and his abrasive tweets on this issue. He's only proving that he doesn't understand how local bus manufacturing in Australia actually works. Now, the electric buses being trialled can carry 65 passengers and offer impressive battery performance. The buses are designed to complete a full day's service on a single charge. In fact, they can travel over 250 kilometres and operate 20 hours continuously. Recharging is completed at night using fast plug-in charging installed at the Eagle Farm Depot and it only takes four hours, Chair. One of the more exciting components being tested through the trial is the Lord Mayor said of the new passenger information systems. Passengers will be able to read a screen at the front of the bus showing the next stop and connecting services that they can jump on at each different stop. Uh, audio announcements with passenger information will also be played throughout the route. Both of these features can assist those with hearing and vision impairments, so we're keen to see how this technology may improve the passenger experience for those with disabilities. I was lucky to hop on board a test loop of the first vehicle a few weeks ago, and I was very impressed by the quietness uh, of the buses. It makes for a very peaceful and pleasant passenger experience, but we're also balancing the potential risks for pedestrians with an alert noise at the front of the bus, so people are aware of the buses as they approach. Beyond these innovative features, electric powered buses offer a whole host of benefits, Chair. The main benefit being improved air quality through zero tailpipe emissions, as well as reduced operation noise, as I mentioned. Electric buses are also generally able to provide reduced maintenance and whole of life costs. The trial will operate over the next 12 months and the learnings from the trial will also help inform future bus build contracts. Travelling on electric buses is noticeably different to trips on the rest of our fleet and I encourage councillors and those listening via live stream to hop on one of our purple buses and make the new trip around the City Loop. Further questions? Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, I'm following up on my question from last week regarding uh, the mural at Hefferon Park in Annerley. Um, I received a note from the Chair of City Standards this morning uh, stating that Council's <coughs> procurement policies are very important and they must be followed. Um, Lord Mayor, I refer you to SP 103, Council's Procurement Policy and Plan. That lists a number of exemptions under Schedule A to standard procurement processes, and they include um, these two relevant ones. Uh, firstly, uh, number five, uh, works that fall under a so social or micro enterprise that offer value for money, or two, more specifically I think, the low value procurement uh, exemption, which is specifically designed to ensure that uh, Council's procurement processes are not uh, unduly complicated when it comes to small, value, uh, small matters. It also requires value for money and benchmarking. Lord Mayor, as you are aware, I have a community artist who uh, has provided a proposal to Council that would cost $2,500. Council wanted to charge $11,000 for the same process. Why is this Council referring to some shadowy internal process uh, when the Council procurement process, SP 103, specifically allows for low value procurement for social purposes why is Council blocking this mural in Annerley? Lord Mayor. <clears throat> uh, another interesting question uh, from the Councillor for Tennyson Ward. We can see uh, that Council uh, the Councillor for Tennyson Ward referred to a memo that she received. Um, so I will read the full memo uh, for the Council record. Um, Dear Councillor Johnston, thank you for your email of 14th of May 2021 about your proposed suburban enhancement fund project for a mural to be painted on the back wall of a toilet at Heffernan Park, Annerley. Uh, I am told the proposed mural is one component in your suburban enhancement fund project for an upgrade of Heffernan Park. I understand that Asset Services investigated your request and sought advice from news and the public arts team on the best way to proceed. While well, I appreciate that you attained a quote from an external artist to provide a mural, you will be aware that Council has certain procurement processes that must be followed. 
This is, an import, this is important for accountability and transparency purposes in the expenditure of ratepayer money. Uh, with that said, I can advise you that the murals policy, particularly as it relates to SEF delivery, is currently under review. I hope to be in a position to provide you with an update on this review in due course. So um, what we have seen here, and that's a very reasonable response, and uh, well, Councillor Johnson said that's not a reasonable response. Uh, uh, well, I would simply say that what Councillor Johnston claimed was that, uh, first of all, that uh, we had been blocking her from pointing a mur painting a mural uh, and that uh, she had been Councillor overcharged. Councillor Johnston, please allow the answer to be heard in silence, Lord Mayor. Uh, and she had been overcharged and she didn't like the fact that uh, there was a procurement policy in place. Uh, she claimed it was a shadowy procurement Point policy. Of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, relevance. My question was about SP103 yeah, yeah, no, Council's you, procurement policy and why no, no, that yep, policy uh, was not being this followed. This is not an opportunity to reread your question. Lord Mayor, please continue. Thank you. Um, Councillor Johnston referred to the procurement policy, which has come through this chamber and been approved by Council as a shadowy procurement policy. Um, uh, but what Point she of is, order, claim to be misrepresented. Well, that's okay. what All I right. heard. I, okay. I don't know if anyone we'll else heard that, we'll but that's what here. I heard, a shadowy procurement policy um, or process. Now, look, the reality is uh, there are rules in place for a reason, and Council makes sure that we uh, use the absolute highest standards of integrity when it comes to procurement. Now, that may be an inconvenience to some people, but obviously that exists for a reason. Now. Obviously, uh, we've been, uh, Councillor Johnson has been notified that this matter is being reviewed to see if there are some improvements that can be made. And so, as I said, a very reasonable response has been made here and um, an endeavour to let her know that this is being reviewed and she'll be updated once that review occurs. What we want to see here is a reasonable outcome. Now, what Councillor Johnson continues to suggest is that, that we're always unreasonable. In everything we do, in every decision we make, she claims we are wrong or unreasonable. She claims it is not good enough. But what we are seeing here is the facts show, the memo shows, which I, wrote, I read out word for word, that our response has been very reasonable and we've taken a reasonable approach to this issue. Uh, we haven't said no. We haven't denied her request. We're simply saying we're going to review this matter. That is a reasonable response. That is a reasonable response. Councillor Johnston, Councillor Johnston, if you do not cease interjecting, I will move to the formal warning process. The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Look, I'll take that interjection from Councillor Johnston. For those who didn't hear, she said that I want to charge $11,000. Well, I don't want to charge you anything, Councillor Johnston. Um, you may have had discussions with council officers about different costs. They weren't with me. They weren't with me. And what I have done here is, in a very reasonable and measured way, Councillor respond Johnston, to your Lord Mayor, question. Councillor Johnston, uh, I consider that you are displaying unsuitable meeting conduct in accordance with section 21.5 of the meeting's local law, and I hereby request that you cease interjecting and refrain from exhibiting the, this conduct. The Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, Councillor Johnson, you had a misrepresentation. Uh, yes, thank you so much. The Lord Mayor, Lord Mayor misrepresented what I said. I referred to Council's procurement policy, SP 103, and then referred to the shadowy murals okay. policy Th that yeah. Council... I would like thank to finish no, my no, sentence, no, please. Point. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. I would Johnston. like to finish my no, sentence, you've, you've please. Finished your point. Um, no, I have I, not. Th this you've is cut a, this me is off. This is a time limited. I would like no, to finish my statement, Johnston, please. Councillor Johnston, no, no, no more. Mr. Councillor Johnston, this is a Mr. time Chairman, limited. Mr Chairman, I am entitled to finish my statement, thank you. Uh, you you've made you a point. You did not allow you've me to. Do not argue with me. You've made a point. This is a time... You did not allow me to finish a time-limited, time-sensitive period of the Council for scrutiny of the I executive. I will not be intimidated. Not, I am no, allowed I'm not to intimidating speak you. and I am allowed point to finish my statement. No, no, that's point yes, of order, I okay, point of order to you, Councillor Owen. I am Owen. allowed to finish my statement. Please allow me to point do so under point, 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 point of order, order, point of order Mr. Chairman, Councillor Owen. Mr Chairman, the rules in this place clearly state oh. that when the Chairman of Council speaks that any other Councillor must resume your, their seat and and uh, cease speaking. Councillor Johnston has repeatedly refused to comply with your direction and I ask you to rule on this, please. Thank you. As I say, the, the point of order um, is correct and that uh, 
the matter that Councillor Johnston was referring to will now no longer continue and we will proceed to further questions. Are there any other questions? Councillor McCoy. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. I dissent in your ruling. Uh, there is a dissent seconded. in my ruling and seconded by Councillor Griffiths. Um, all those in favour of dissent, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. No. The noes have it. Further questions, Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Acting Chair of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Davis. Councillor Davis, it was reported last week that the State of Queensland is lagging behind other states when it comes to cutting carbon emissions. Can you update the Chamber on Council's emissions footprint? How does Brisbane City Council compare? Councillor Davis. Oh, well, thank you, Mr Chair, and through you I thank Councillor Mackay for the question. When it comes to climate action, the Schrinner Council is proud to be a leading government in Australia. We are passionate about reducing and completely offsetting our own emissions and helping residents to reduce their footprint at home. So it was very concerning to read reports recently that Point Queensland... Point of order, Chair, the Lord Mayor. The uh, Leader of the Opposition is interjecting about China again. It's very inappropriate. Oh, thank you. That, all right. Please allow the answer. To be, please allow Councillor Davis's answer to be heard in silence. Councillor Davis. Well, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I was saying that uh, it was very concerning recently to read reports that Queensland as a whole is not on the same trajectory as uh, Brisbane City Council, because according to the most recent data set from the National Greenhouse Accounts for 2019, Queensland's carbon emissions have gone up since the state Labor government took office in 2015. Compare that to other states where, in the same period, emissions dropped by 5.2 per cent in New South Wales. Councillor Strunk, no, Councillor Davis. Councillor Strunk, I've asked you to, um, to uh, stop interjecting and now I will move to the rules. Councillor Strunk, I consider that you're displaying unsuitable meeting conduct and in accordance with section 21.5 of the Meetings Local Law 2001, I hereby request that you cease interjecting and refrain from exhibiting that conduct. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. And it's clear that the opposition don't like to hear what's not happening with regards to... Point of um, order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Deputy Mayor is interjecting, the Leader of the Opposition is interjecting. Why are you applying the rules in one way to me uh, and in another way to other councillors? I in don't this agree. Chamber? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, as I was saying, that in the same period we were comparing to other states um, where uh, emissions dropped by 5.2 per cent in New South Wales, 21.2 per cent in Victoria, and 10.8 per cent in South Australia. So, unlike the efforts of uh, state uh, Labor governments in other states. Um, all councillors should be proud of the efforts here, unlike that down George Street, um, of how we are reducing our council's footprint. Uh, Mr Chair, Brisbane City Council has been certified as carbon neutral since 2017, and we remain Australia's largest carbon neutral government. We are also the only carbon neutral organisation with an operating landfill and major public transport service. We have now purchased more than 1 million megawatt hours of electricity from, from renewable energy sources and purchased and cancelled around 2.8 million carbon offsets. On top of carbon neutrality, we remain committed to further reducing our emissions and since 2017 our footprint has reduced by 7%. We know transport emissions are a major contributor to our footprint, which is why the Schrinner Council is investing in sustainable, public and active transport solutions. Whether it's our award-winning fully electric Brisbane Metro project, our nation-leading approach to e-mobility, or our continued investment in better pedestrian and cyclist connections, we are doing everything we can to support residents to leave the car at home and travel sustainably. Councillors would uh, be aware that of the great benefits being realised by clubs in their wards through our Resilient Clubs program, supporting clubs in improving both energy and water efficiency and funding over 35 new commercial scale solar systems to help with both environmental and finan financial sustainability. Uh, this is in addition to similar projects at our not-for-profit community facilities funded through the Lord Mayor's environmental grants. 
Council's solar portfolio has seen more than a more than a tenfold increase since 2016, and it will only continue to grow in the years ahead, with projects like our new Brisbane Metro Depot at Rochdale, which will include a one megawatt system. We continue to drive down emissions in delivering Council's core services, like using recycled asphalt to reduce requirements for bitumen and aggregate. We have upgraded the heating system and insulation in the storage bins at Eagle Farm Asphalt Plant to reduce energy consumed in maintaining the temperature of asphalt prior to delivery. We have retrofitted more than 25,000 streetlights with energy efficient lamps, and all new and replacement lamps across the city are LEDs where possible. Mr Chair, government is just one piece of the puzzle, and as part of our broader vision for our city, our goal is to see household carbon emissions reduced by 50 per cent by 2031. The Schrinner Council has developed the Brisbane Carbon Challenge, which includes a comprehensive but user-friendly online carbon calculator to help the community understand what their carbon footprint is made up of and the steps that they can take to reduce it. We, of course, recently hosted the first Green Heart Fair for 2021, which provided inspiration and motivation to more than 20,000 attendees to be more green in their everyday life. Mr Chair, Brisbane is a global city, and with the possibility of hosting the 2032 Olympics, we know the world is watching us. Sustainability is a key pillar of the Olympic movement going forward, and we know that officials have been very impressed by the work already done by the Schrinner Council in creating a holistic sustainability agenda for our city. Indeed, the report released by the Future Host Commission Councillor last Davis, week— Councillor Davis, your time has expired. Any Thank further you, questions? Chair. Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, we know local manufacturers have the capability to make articulated electric buses here in Australia, yet you and the LNP have ordered all 60 metro buses from Europe. Again, you're sending jobs offshore, and this time it's one of the biggest projects in recent history for this council. You ordered electric buses from China for the city loop trial, as we know, and you're ordering all 60 buses for the metro from Switzerland. Lord Mayor, you've single-handedly sent hundreds of stable local manufacturing jobs offshore. On what planet is it OK to snub hundreds of local jobs in the middle of an economic recovery? The Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, through you, Councillor Cassidy just hasn't been paying attention, has he? Um, the, all of these matters have been covered consistently, but he will return to delivering his uh, crafted political line that is designed um, to excite uh, his supporters in the union movement. Um, and look, we know what he's doing. We know why he's doing it. There's obviously um, some kind of future pre-selection coming up that he's very interested in. Point of order, Mr um, Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Uh, the, uh, the rules of procedure are very clear that you should not be commenting on the motives of a councillor for undertaking a question as the Lord Mayor is doing. That's inappropriate. Thank you, you Councillor Johnston. Out of order. Uh, as, the, as I often say, please re re uh, ref refrain from uh, adverse reflections on other councillors. Well, Mayor. if that was the case, then Councillor Cassidy's question should have been ruled out of order because he was certainly commenting on our motives. Um, so uh, they like democracy when it suits them, but not when it doesn't. So, uh, and um, look, let's talk about uh, the Metro and let's talk about public transport. Uh, so um, Councillor Cassidy tried to make uh, some assertion that uh, Metro would create jobs offshore at the expense of local jobs. Well, interestingly, part of the tender process for Metro was Volgren as the local manufacturer. They were involved in the tender process and they were part of the winning bid. Uh, but what I can say is that Metro will create 2,600 local jobs. 2,600 local jobs. A project that Councillor Cassidy consistently has opposed and criticised. So there's only one person against local jobs here, and that is Councillor Cassidy and the Labor opposition, because they don't support Brisbane Metro. They can't bring themselves to support it, a project that creates local jobs and a project that involves a partnership with Volgren, local bus company Volgren, the one that they are trying to champion. So. Uh, like I said, either Councillor Cassidy isn't aware of the facts or conveniently decides to ignore those facts to make a political point. Now, uh, we went out to tender uh, on the electric bus trial in 2019, and uh, even before that, we went out to tender on the Brisbane Metro. But what I can tell you, what I can tell you for certain 
is that there are no local manufacturers that can fully assemble a vehicle like the HESS bi-articulated fully electric vehicle here in Brisbane or in Australia. There is nothing like this being made in Australia and there is no local company that has the capacity to deliver it here in Australia. Now, there is a component of the assembly that's being done locally, and that's great, and that's what we wanted. We wanted to see that local assembly happening, but to be able to fully manufacture these vehicles here, this is not something that any local tenderers could offer in the tender process for Metro, which also was a highly competitive tender process that was open not only uh, internationally, but also locally. So we got world leading uh, edge technology with our metro vehicles, and uh, that is a process that was very clear that we gave local companies the opportunity to be a part of. And we are pleased that Volgren was part of the winning tender. But to be able to do it fully here, that was not something that was put forward by any tenderer in the tender process. And at this point in time, there are no vehicles like the Metro vehicles being built here in Australia. There's just nothing like it. It is uh, world leading uh, and it is very specialised technology, it is cutting edge. Uh, and we, it's a game changer. It is a game changer. Uh, well, you know, Councillor Street, at least Councillor Street has been listening. It's a game changer. The turn up and go Brisbane Metro will be a game changer. Yeah. And especially for Councillor Shree's residents in his ward, who will, who will love jumping on the fully electric, game-changing Brisbane Metro. Um, so thank you, Councillor Shree, for that interjection, and I appreciate that you do listen in Council Question Time. Um, I, uh, I was very proud that this administration, our team, uh, was the very first to introduce a local procurement policy where we target 80% of contracts being awarded to local business. Now, did we say 100% of contracts? We didn't. We didn't. We didn't do that. But 80% was an ambitious target, and I'm pleased to say that in the month of May last month, we not only met that target, we exceeded it with almost 85% of contracts going to local businesses. So we have a clear record of supporting local business and supporting local jobs. Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Thank you. That concludes question time. Councillors, we'll now proceed to the consideration of committee reports. The Establishment and Co Coordination Committee, please, Lord Mayor. Uh, my time is still says five minutes. So, there we go. Please okay. proceed. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 7th June 2021 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, the 7th of June 2021 be adopted. Is there any debate? The Lord Mayor. Point of order. Point of order. Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I move that item A and item I are taken seriatim for debate and voting purposes. Item A and item I will be taken seriatim for debate and vote together. Item A and item I. Are there any other seriatums before we move on? Lord Mayor, can I please ask you to make general comments and then when it comes time to debate this resolution, we'll do B through H first and then A and I second. The Lord Mayor. Okay, thanks Mr Chair, no problem with that. Okay, uh, before I move on to the items in front of us, I just wanted to uh, talk about the lighting of council assets. Uh, as I normally do. Uh, today marks World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Uh, Uniting Care Queensland, a lead unit which offers a port of call uh, helpline for anyone experiencing elder abuse or who is concerned about someone they know uh, has initiated this. Uh, June 15th each year is the day designated by the United Nations as the International Day of Action Against World Elder Abuse. Uh, obviously, uh, one of those um, terribly sad and often hidden problems in our community, uh, but a real one and one that I'm pleased uh, there's recognition being brought to, and I'm pleased that we can support this recognition. Uh, so this evening, Brisbane City Hall, the Sandgate Town Hall, Radcliffe Place and Story Bridge and Victoria Bridges will be lit up in purple to show our support uh, for World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Uh, Bowel Cancer Awareness Month uh, 
is in June. So this month is Bowel Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, bowel cancer claims the lives of 103 Australians every single week. Uh, but it's one of the most treatable forms of cancer if it's identified early. Uh, and in support, the Redcliffe Place sculptures, Victoria and Story Bridges will be lit in red and green tomorrow evening. On Saturday evening, City Hall uh, will, lit up, will light up in rainbow colours to support the Queen's Ball Awards event at City Hall. And in fact, this will be the 60th anniversary of the Queen's Ball. Uh, this event serves as a major fundraiser for Brisbane Pride Festival, raising vital funds uh, for the better mental health and wellbeing of LGBTIQ plus communities. Uh, and I understand that this may be one of the world's longest running LGBTI events. Is that right, Councillor Howell? It is? Yeah, um, which is just amazing. So um, uh, we're uh, obviously uh, lighting up the City Hall in rainbow uh, for that special event. Okay, I also did want to report back on a very exciting announcement that uh, we had just in recent days. Uh, the Museum of Brisbane, um, in this building, upstairs, and one of uh, the great tourist attractions of our city, has been honoured with a prestigious award uh, for the Museum and Galleries National Association in the category of Temporary or Travelling Exhibition for the exhibition of the storytellers. Now, uh, has anyone seen that exhibition? Absolutely fantastic. Uh, so that was, uh, that awards ceremony was held in Canberra last week. Um, and our Museum of Brisbane Chairman of the Board, Sally Ann Atkinson, uh, accepted the award on behalf of MO Brisbane, uh, MOB uh, Brisbane team. Uh, and also, uh, I want to congratulate the entire team, not only Sally Ann as the Chair of the Board, but the entire team and also uh, the contributors, the authors that made that a, real, a reality, that um, a wonderful exhibition, including some of our truly famous local authors like Trent Dalton, who was part of it, uh, among few. So there was Nick Earls, Kate Morton, Trent Dalton, Victoria Carlos, Benjamin Law uh, and others. To Renee Grace, the CEO uh, and her team a huge congratulations and thanks on behalf of all of us in this room uh, for winning that award. Well done. Moving forward to the items in front of us. Item B, uh, the bonding of uncompleted works to enable early sealing of survey plans. This is a policy which has not been updated since 1996 and at that time the bonding limit was set at $200,000. Obviously a lot has changed since 1996. Uh, so there have been requests and demands for this uh, limit to be updated. Obviously, since this time, the cost of construction has gone up and uh, we have moved to raise the bonding ceiling or the bond ceiling to $350,000, uh, which is uh, in line with CPI increases over that time. Uh, so a uh, pretty straightforward proposal, which is about adjusting to um, the change in cost and CPI and a reasonable outcome uh, in response to this particular policy. Uh, item C, the, the lease of council land to community organisations. Uh, this is about uh, renewing lease ar arrangements at 24 council owned sites. And I understand Councillor Howard will elaborate on this item. But some of the leases include the Banyo Rugby League Club, Metro Arts, North East Street City Farm and Wellers Hill Bowls Club. This submission to council is a standard process each time community leases are renewed. Item D is the lease of premises for Fleet Solutions. This relates to the Fleet Solutions uh, location at Waycole. Uh, Council's current lease commenced uh, in June 2012 with an expiry date for June 2022, i.e. next year. Uh, two further five-year option terms are available. Council is required to exercise the first five-year option term no later than 18th of December 2021. As a result of negotiations between Council and the lessor, uh, an offer of new lease with a reduced rent has been provided, and so uh, we're proposing we go ahead in taking up that offer. Council is expected to benefit from a reduced financial commitment of approximately $2.8 million over the term of the new lease. Item E relates to uh, the parking and control of traffic amending local law 2021. 
Now, this uh, particular item uh, was originated um, thanks to a state government request uh, to change uh, parking fines for those who abuse disability parking spots. And uh, so, with local law changes, basically uh, the process that plays out is that this is put forward by Brisbane City Council, then goes to the state government for a check uh, before it comes back uh, with either their support or otherwise before it becomes uh, law. Uh, what has happened here is we've taken the opportunity to review um, parking fines that relate particularly to infringements or uh, illegal parking that impacts on others in a very negative way. Now, uh, to be very clear, we have not changed the fine for overstaying a parking metre, which makes up a large percentage of the fines issued. So if you overstay a parking metre, um, you know, that hasn't changed at all. But where we have uh, made changes or recommended changes is the offences that put others in danger. And it's the same principle as the increase to the disability parking fine. People who abuse disability parking spots are, are really um, doing the wrong thing by others and doing the wrong thing by some of the most vulnerable people in our community. And so it's a no-no, but also uh, stopping on or near a children's crossing is a no-no. Stopping on or near a pedestrian crossing is a no-no. Stopping on or near a marked foot crossing is a no-no. Stopping at or near a bicycle crossing light is a no-no. Stopping in a taxi zone illegally is also a no-no uh, because it makes it hard for our uh, hard-working taxi drivers um, to find a spot to pick up passengers. There is a lot of demand for space around the city. They have allocated zones. It's only fair that they are available for taxis. Stopping in a bus zone, something that impacts on our hard-working bus operators every single day. They're trying to do their job, trying to pull in and out of bus stops, very busy bus stops, and having an inconsiderate driver blocking the bus stop, not only inconveniences the bus operator, but the hundreds of passengers each day that this impacts on uh, around the city. So that's a no-no. Stopping on or near a safety zone, a no-no. Uh, there's another issue here as well, stopping in a clear way. This is something that causes major congestion around our city and impacts on hundreds if not thousands of other people every week when someone parks illegally in a clear way. And so these are the type of penalties that have been proposed to increase and uh, not the standard overstaying a parking metre fine. Uh, so we're looking at the safety here, the inconvenience to others, the impact on other people around the city, and those fines have been increased to act as a deterrent for exactly the same reason that we want to deter people from abusing disability parking spots, uh, Council McLaughlin. Now, I make a little prediction. I think the opposition, if they are true to form, and they are generally pretty predictable, will say, oh, this is revenue raising. It's revenue raising. I will point out that parking fines make up what percentage of council revenue? Does anyone know? Is it 40 per cent? Is it 30 per cent? 20 per cent? No? It is 1 per cent. Parking fines make up 1 per cent of council revenue. So when the Leader of the Opposition gets up and says, oh, this is about plugging a budget black hole and oh, my financial Lord, mismanagement... Lord Mayor, your, your time has expired. <laughs> Move for an extension. An, Second. an extension of time has been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Landers. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, so when he makes those predictable comments, um, you know the facts. The facts are parking fines make up 1% of council revenue. Uh, and if his claim is to be true, that this is somehow a measure uh, to uh, get extra revenue in for council, well, uh, that's not going to work. <laughs> that's not going to work. Um, you could double or triple the fines um, and it still uh, wouldn't go beyond a very low level in terms of council's overall uh, revenue. So the reality is what we want to see here is a deterrent to certain types of inconsiderate and dangerous behaviour. That's what we want to see. 
and uh, the fewer fines that are issued, the better. And I can say, year after year, what happens is the council predicts an amount of fine revenue in the budget, and year after year, the actual number of fines that are issued are far lower than that. Far lower. Happens every year. And let me predict another thing that will happen. Tomorrow in the budget, they'll be like, oh, parking fines, it's going up, everything's going up, everyone's going to get fined. The reality is, year after year, fewer fines are issued than what are predicted in the budget. And I have no reason to suspect or believe that the coming financial year will be any different to that. Um, so uh, this is not anything to do with the budget. This is about public safety. It's about reinforcing positive driver behaviour and a deterrent to negative uh, behaviour that inconveniences uh, and potentially harms other people. The uh, item F is the amendment to the lease of the Crushers Leagues Club. Uh, and that's an update to the lease conditions for the Crushers Leagues Club to bring the definition of turnover in line with the definition used by the Office of Liquor and Gaming. Uh, the amendment does not change the terms uh, of the minimum required community contributions outlined within the Crushers Lease Agreement. Uh, and it's about those defi definitions so that we're consistent with state legislation. Uh, item G is a uh, proposed uh, health, safety and amenity local law change. When gazetted at the end of this process, uh, it would repeal and replace the HASSEL 2009. HASSEL obviously being short for health, safety and amenity local law. What this local law is fundamentally about is something that I'm passionate about and something that Councillor Marks is also passionate about, which is city standards city standards. And so uh, while um, uh, others in this place um, are quite happy to see people illegally dumping, we're not. While others in this place um, are quite happy for a certain building owners to do the wrong thing, uh, we are not. Because it's important that we set a good example and have strong laws in place uh, to set city standards. And I have to say, if you go to other cities, you will notice very clearly uh, that Brisbane is a very clean and well-maintained place. Uh, there is fewer uh, amounts of graffiti here. There is less rubbish here. Uh, the general maintenance of Brisbane is better than so many other places. And also, uh, a lot of people take great pride in the presentation of their properties and they go the extra mile by maintaining the frontage of their nature strip uh, or footpath. No one obliges them to do that, but they do the right thing by the city uh, and they take pride in the maintenance of their property and their nature strip as well. And that is a good thing and something we should encourage. Uh, but I know Councillor Marks and Councillor Davis will speak to the changes in more uh, details, uh, but this is not a complete rewrite of the existing local law. Uh, but it is a, an update uh, that is required based on some uh, current issues that need to be addressed. One of those is the new regulative, regulatory framework for fire pits and braziers following the successful trial that we conducted uh, last year. Now, obviously, that was something that generated a lot of interest and uh, we saw great community support in terms of the ability to use fire pits and braziers, but in a safe and reasonable manner. And so what we've done is we've put a framework in place which defines more clearly what it is to be using these things safely. It also defines what constitutes a nuisance with these things, and then gives council the power to conduct enforcement as necessary to make sure that it is not conducting a nuisance. Uh, so these sort of things are common sense changes that provide greater clarity, on the framework, uh, but also cover things like uh, shopping trolleys, unsightly object, ex, objects and overgrown vegetation, hazardous and electrical fencing, swimming pools, wading pools and ponds. Uh, so uh, public consultation will be open from the 17th of June through to the 7th of July. We'll also undergo a state interest check. Uh, so just like the other change that I mentioned earlier regarding parking, it will go to the state government before coming uh, back to council. Uh, item H is uh, an SCP for man, bus, original equipment manufacturer, spare parts. 
Uh, council has a fleet of over 1,200 buses, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and around 400 of these are MAN buses, or MAN buses. Uh, the significant contracting plan before us uh, is related to provision of spare parts for these buses. Regular maintenance is undertaken on Transport for Brisbane's fleet uh, to make sure they're in good condition while travelling along our roads and busways. And uh, we use original equipment manufacturer spare parts for any bus maintenance to ensure that the materials used are of the highest standard and the correct specification for the buses. So it's particularly important to use high quality parts for the brakes, steering, suspension and the fuel system. So we choose to get these parts directly from the manufacturer MAN. Majority of these parts we require are held locally at the MAN distribution centre in Waco, uh, and uh, this sets up a contracting plan in relation to that. Now, I think that's all the items, um, that's right. apart from the two that will be dealt with separately. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, further speakers, before I call anyone, just a reminder to all councillors that items A and I will be debated separately later in the meeting. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, yes, thanks very much, Chair. Um, so I'll speak on these items, B through uh, H on here. So uh, item B is the bonding of uncompleted works uh, to enable the early sealing of survey pl uh, plans. Uh, and it is, uh, is about time that this occurred uh, and that uh, the bond front completed developments was increased. The last time, as we've heard, uh, this happened, uh, that these charges were increased was uh, a quarter of a century ago. Uh, a quarter of a century ago in 1996 when Jim Sawley was mayor. So we wonder why it has taken uh, this administration uh, so long, given they've been in this place in charge for the last 17 years. I'm sure it uh, doesn't have anything to do uh, with uh, the development industry. Uh, clause C, uh, those leases to uh, council land, leases off council land and community organisation will be supporting this of course to grant 24 leases to community clubs. Uh, we would certainly like to see more support of those community clubs however. Uh, with the Olympics coming up, we need to be doing absolutely everything we can uh, to make sure we bolster those community clubs, not just, uh, not just make a fake announcement and say that we're doing something, actually uh, do something and um, propose some new spending uh, with them. Those children and teenagers that are uh, playing uh, at those community sporting clubs right now uh, will be the athletes of 2032. Uh, but under this administration, we know we know on this side, and I'm sure they know on that side, but won't admit it, uh, that community clubs are being neglected uh, under this administration. Uh, so if perhaps the advertising budget, uh, and those clubs are struggling to pay their water bills and even keep their lights on, let alone maintain those buildings, and they're expected to produce the athletes of 2032. Uh, well, they certainly need more support. Uh, this Lord Mayor uh, could do with cutting his advertising budget, perhaps, Chair, and uh, investing a little more in our community and sporting clubs. Uh, clause E, the uh, proposed changes to parking and control of traffic uh, amending local law uh, 2021. The Lord Mayor is not content to just talk about me, now he likes to uh, impersonate me uh, in the council chamber now, uh, obsessed much. Uh, but this is an item that the state government announced uh, in terms of increasing penalties for uh, people parking illegally uh, in disability bays. That was about 18 months ago. 18 months ago. It's taken this LNP administration a year and a half to actually get with the program and introduce uh, these tougher fines. And we want to make sure, we support these of course, we want to make sure that this amendment will stop people uh, like this parking illegally uh, in disability bays. Uh, we know that that's the wrong thing to do. We agree with the Lord Mayor when he says that's a no-no. Uh, we know that. Uh, so we want to make sure that people aren't parking illegally when they shouldn't be in those disability bays. Uh, but what we do know in here, and the Lord Mayor has tried to, tried to uh, obfuscate a little bit already on this, but what we know is that off their own bat, the LNP are increasing uh, parking fines on 16 other categories as well, and they haven't been required to do that. Uh, and I think it's pretty, uh, pretty cold comfort to people uh, who are being stung uh, by this administration to say that it's only 1% of revenue. So. Uh, suck it up when we increase the fines and some of these fines by 100 per cent. So that 1% that of revenue is going to climb pretty steeply uh, when we know that this administration is setting revenue targets for our compliance officers to go out and meet. 
Uh, we know that because they're sent out in the middle of the night uh, to go out into outer suburbs and uh, issue fines to people instead of, uh, instead of warnings, instead of talking to the community and educating the community. Uh, they are being sent out by this administration to raise revenue. Uh, we know that this administration has form uh, in this place, Chair. Uh, they slashed curbside collection last year and, lo and behold, a 300 per cent increase uh, in fines for uh, illegal dumping on the footpath uh, have been issued. Uh, and this, this amendment has been uh, brought to Council on the eve of the Council budget. Uh, and we know that they would have been planning for some time because they'll build in those revenue targets into the council budget and try and sneak this one through without anyone noticing uh, on budget eve. But uh, this does confirm, Chair, that this LNP administration is very much in it for themselves and not the people of Brisbane. Uh, clause G, uh, the proposed health and safety amenity local law. Uh, this is primarily uh, the, the proposed local law that allows backyard fire pits and built-up residential areas. And we certainly hope that the more than 500 smoke complaints that were made during the trial were considered um, seriously. Uh, we know that those complaints almost doubled, doubled from the previous year. Uh, there are quite a number of people that live in our community who are vulnerable uh, to health impacts from uh, this smoke, and we know that there have been serious concerns around the process um, of making those complaints throughout that trial uh, were raised by members of the community, so we certainly hope that when this uh, local law is implemented uh, that uh, those complaints are going to be taken seriously uh, and that the process is robust enough uh, and user-friendly enough uh, for members of the community to be able to live healthily in our community. Uh, this, this local law also deals with another uh, serious issue. Uh, we could also call it the uh, Save Councillor Angela Owen local law. Uh, when Councillor Owen was at the centre of uh, some serious scrutiny when a 10-year-old girl was electrocuted in a park in the Callum Vale ward, uh, we, we moved an urgency motion in here, Chair, calling uh, for electric fences to be banned near parks and playgrounds. That motion was, of course, voted down by LNP councillors, uh, despite the electrocution of this young girl. Point uh, of order, we certainly Mr. hope that local law means that Point something... Of order, Councillor Owen. Point of order. Um, if Councillor Cassidy um, would be correct and truthful, the girl was not electrocuted. No, 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 thank electrocution you. refers to Councillor death. Owen, no, hang on, Councillor Owen. I need to, the, the way to do that would be to, to call a misrepresentation. He's misleading. Uh, point of order, Mr. Chair. He is misleading the chamber. The girl was not no, electrocuted. No, no. She did not All die, right. and that Th is a false thank statement. You. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, this motion was, of course, voted down by LNP councillors. Uh, so we certainly hope that this new local law uh, means something has been done about electric fences near public spaces. Uh, we, knew, we took that very seriously at the time, and we're disappointed that LNP councillors didn't. Uh, but we know, uh, of course, uh, that um, this is, uh, and this LNP administration will readily use local laws to save face, whether it's in advertising uh, or in this um, space as well, Chair. Um, so uh, that's Clause F, of course, is the Leeds to Crushers Leeds Club, which uh, we will be uh, supporting and supporting Clause H as well. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Yeah. Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. Um, just wanted to speak on the, the health and safety local law. Um, it's a shame that Lord Mayor's not in the chamber. I always want him to hear my comments. And he, he, he gives his speech and then he leaves. And I'm not actually sure if he ever knows what I've said. But hopefully someone will pass that on to him and, and be kind enough to convey what I've said. Um, look, my, my main concern is um, with this, cha this law, and, and I'd be really keen for someone to, to respond to this. Maybe, um, I don't know if Councillor Marks is going to speak on this one or whoever, um, but I, I'm, I'm just genuinely interested in the answer, and I'm not trying to score political points or anything that, like that, but Section 22 of the, the new local law includes that offence of camping on roads. So it says, person must not camp overnight in a vehicle or on, on a road, in a, in a vehicle on a road, sorry. And, I think that's been a general kind of offence under the previous local law as well. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's necessarily a completely new change, but I, I am concerned that even through this update process, we seem to be continuing that pattern of fining people for camping overnight in their vehicle. Now, the, the, the law does include a couple of 
exceptions. It, it says um, you can't camp in your vehicle in an, if it's permitted by an official traffic sign or if it occurs in a tourist accommodation um, area. You can also camp in your vehicle if um, it's, a, the, this is, I'm just quoting from the, the draft law here, A, for fatigue management, um, B, for personal safety, or C, otherwise in emergent circumstances. And, and I would respectfully suggest that um, that legal, dra that drafting is a little bit vague because um, I'm not 100% sure what would be covered by otherwise in emergent circumstances. I hope, and I take it to mean that that includes if someone is homeless. Um, but good legislative drafting principles would suggest that if you're trying to, if, you, if what your intention to, is to say that people won't be fined for sleeping in their cars if they're homeless, then just say that. Just be really explicit and have a specific subsection. You've got, you've got A, B, C there. You could just add D and say, won't be fined if they're homeless. Um, and I think it's a shame that the, the, law, the local law the, or the draft local law isn't that specific. Um, the, I guess what's also interesting is pretty much any reason that someone might camp or sleep in their car could, under a broad interpretation, be covered by those three options. Fatigue management, personal safety, otherwise in emergent circumstances. Uh, for example, I could, I could sleep in my car and the council officers come and knock on my window and say, hey, you're not meant to be sleeping in your car. If I, if I just say, oh, I was fatigued, does that mean they can't find me? Um, maybe. I mean, I'm fine with that, but it kind of begs the question of why even have a law against sleeping in your car? Um, what, what are the particular circumstances or instances where we, we would want to find someone for sleeping in their car? Um, and really the only other Scenario, reason I can think of is just that we, we are worried that someone might sleep in their car and get hit by a moving vehicle and that, that would be really tragic. Um, and I see the logic of that, but I don't think that's a very high practical risk. Um, and, and what I worry about is that by having a local law that makes it illegal to, camp, to sleep in your car, and in fact the, the maximum penalty is up around $6,600, that's a pretty heavy fine for someone sleeping in their car. And we have to think in practical terms about how these local laws are enforced. Because, because we know in, the, in theory or in the abstract, can, what, what we might say is, oh, of course no one who's homeless, who's sleeping in their car is going to be fined like this. But what I suspect will happen is that there will be instances where a council officer sees someone sleeping in their car, writes out the fine, doesn't actually have a conversation with the person because the convert person doesn't want to talk to the council officer, the fine gets issued and then it's up to that vulnerable person to go through a complex and, and onerous legal process of disputing the fine. I've disputed council fines before and even someone with a relatively good education, I, can, I find it frustrating and sometimes difficult. I can only imagine how difficult it would be for someone who's sleeping in their car because they've been escaping domestic violence or they're long-term homeless or mentally ill. Someone like that is not going to be in a good position to raise these defences of, oh, I was in an emergent circumstance. So my concern is partly about the drafting of the local law itself, but it's also a deeper con concern about how it will be enforced in practice. And what I'd really like to hear from the administration councillors is, is there any data at all on how many people have been fined for sleeping in their car over the last year or over the last few years? Maybe that's something that the administration can take on notice and get back to me later in the day on. Um, I don't know how often this offence is actually used, but personally I don't think the event offence needs to exist at all. We already have other offences for littering, we have other offences for like defecating in public places. Um, all the specific concerns that might be attached to someone sleeping in a car are already dealt with through other local laws and other um, state government offences. So I don't really understand what the practical purpose is of criminalising people for sleeping in their cars. If they're parked illegally, you can fine them for that. If, if there's a problem, um, there, there was before I became a councillor concerns about a whole bunch of people sleeping in their cars along Riverside Drive uh, in West End, and the council solution there was actually just to change the parking rules to make it no standing from midnight to 4 a.m., which was a funny kind of workaround when you think about it. But I, I guess my point is I don't really see any strong driving need for this offence to exist. But, but what I do see is a very real risk that some of the time, maybe only in a small proportion of cases, but some of the time it will accidentally be used against very vulnerable people who won't be well placed 
to self-advocate. Um, and I see other councillors shaking their heads, and I'm, I'm sure I welcome them to get up and, and correct me on this. Um, but it, it just troubles me that the, the definitions there are, are a little bit ambiguous. And it would, for example, have been preferable to, even in brackets, just as explanatory text, clearly state that this, this offence would not apply to someone who's homeless and who's sleeping in their car who, because they don't have anywhere else to go. Um, personally, I, if, if, if let's say, and this is where it gets really messy, let's say we've got backpackers who can't afford accommodation in Brisbane because it's ridiculously expensive and they're living in their car as they travel around Australia looking for work. Um, if they're clean and they're not um, causing a lot of noise and disruption for residential neighbours and they're parked on a, maybe a, a side street that's an in industrial or commercial precinct where there's not much demand for overnight car parking, I don't really see a big problem with people sleeping in their car like that overnight. I understand the concerns if it's a, a residential area and people in their car are making a lot of noise. But there are whole parts of our city where literally no one even notices that people are sleeping in their car overnight. And so it doesn't, it doesn't seem very necessary for us to be criminalising this so, so broadly. Um, so I would like the administration to articulate clearly what is the need and justification for this law? Why does it exist? Um, and, and if indeed it is simply that we're worried that someone might park on a really, really busy road and might get hit um, by a, a, a poorly driven car or a recklessly driven car, then maybe parking shouldn't be allowed in that place to begin with. But it also raises the question of what's the difference between someone sitting in their car awake um, and why is that less dangerous than someone sitting in their car asleep? It, it just seems like a very arbitrary distinction. And we know from the literature, we know from reports from community legal services, we know from court cases in other jurisdictions around Australia that the, the offence of sleeping in your car does result in homeless and vulnerable people being criminalised and fined. It does lead to um, more interactions with authorities that then spiral into other um, kinds of offences. So, for example, someone's stressed out, they're mentally ill, they're sleeping in their car, they get a knock on the window uh, early in the morning from a council inspector, they don't want to talk to them, but the inspector insists that they open their window, they end up with an ar in an argument with the inspector, maybe they swear at them, and then they can be charged for assaulting a public official. And so that initial offence of sleeping rough in a car ends up leading to further offences and further engagement with the criminal justice system that doesn't really serve anyone's interests and um, further oppresses and criminalises already vulnerable people. Um, and while I'm speaking on this topic, I should note that the public council's public land and council assets local law also still bans rough sleeping in parks. I think that is disgusting and morally repugnant, and this council should be ashamed of itself for criminalising people for sleeping on a park bench. Thanks. Further speakers, Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item B before us today. Um, interesting that Councillor Cassidy, on one hand, complains about um, prices not going up fast enough and then complaining about prices going up too fast. Uh, but this is around uh, changes, obviously, of uncompleted works and bonding to enable early sealing of survey plans, um, something that, is, that hasn't been raised since 1996 because uh, the cost of works, and this is what it relates to, is cost of construction has gone up and down over that period. Obviously, it went up there for a while, down again during GFC, and is going up uh, again now. Now, and this has come from a request from applicants, actually, for a proposal for the bond ceiling to raise to 350000 um, we were comfortable with that amount. We went back and did the checks. That this, this did reflect CPI increases over that uh, quarter of a century, as Councillor Cassidy said as well. So typically, Council will require that minor streetscape upgrades be undertaken as part of a development approval, like tree planning or laying turf. So this is work that shouldn't hold up a project. Um, so instead, we seal the plans and then hold the bond until the work is actually done. Uh, despite having this policy, Council does have the ability to refuse a bonding request if they are known not to comply with standards that are set, though, as well. 
The risk to council is minimal as the bonding will remain at 125 per cent of the value of the uncompleted works and council can call on this security if works are not completed within the agreed time frame. Other minor works which could factor into a bond is fauna friendly fencing, screening for windows, small scale tree planting and other land um, landscaping. And as I mentioned, it's a, it's a good way to make sure that the developments can continue, but we also have that assurance that the conditions we've put on for the uh, residential amenity or whatever the amenity may be not residential is also done by the applicant. As I said, we have received advice from the industry in recent months that they would like to see this bond figure increasing, and that's what we are doing here today. I recommend it to the Chamber. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you. I rise to speak on um, well, possibly all the items uh, A through H. Uh, firstly, sorry, B through H. B through H. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to talk about item B, um, the bonds for early works. Um, we definitely have a problem uh, with development happening and uh, the conditions of development not being met. Um, that is happening on a common basis uh, across the city. Um, and there is no way that there should be a uh, planned ceiling happening until all of the works that are due to be completed are done. Um, it is much harder, much, much harder to try and retrospectively fix it after the case. Um, so I just, I, I have, I don't have a problem with the bond process per se, but the fundamental problem is that council does not do enough in this space to make sure developers actually deliver what they are supposed to deliver. And that is fundamentally the problem. Now, with respect to item C, there is a major problem uh, with community leasing uh, that is uh, happening at the moment. Community leases used to run through a uh, pretty straightforward way, um, but uh, the new process that's been in place now for a few years um, is, is fundamentally damaging and hurting um, our clubs. Uh, and I just say to Councillor Howard um, that the ongoing significant delays in processing community leases for volunteer groups is unacceptable. Um, and I'm specifically referring to a group in my ward um, who've been waiting 18 months for Council to renew their lease. Um, they're a small boating club. There is no problem. Um, Council is, for whatever reason, um, being extremely difficult, um, and they should not be doing this. Um, uh, it is important that where we have um, ongoing community leases that they are done in a timely way, um, that they are done in an open way with the clubs, and there does not and there is not any reason for 18 months for, of delay. That's just unacceptable. Um, in the uh, attachment before us today, there are a couple of leases coming through in my area. I'll just note that the El Salvador Soccer Club um, actually has a different name now. So, I mean, this is how long this takes, this process, that they've had a name change to comply with sporting club regulations, but Council's about to change the lease to their old name, so it's immediately out of date, uh, and the new, it's going to have to be updated again to be a valid and legal document. So there is a problem with the way Council um, is doing this. Um, uh, there's also a problem with the attachment before us today. There's no time frames. So we don't know how long the leases are. Now, normally we're told uh, whether they're four-year four year leases or ten-year leases. Nothing. Not a peep. And I think that's the first time that I've seen Council failing to provide us with any kind of basic information about the terms of a lease in our area. Uh, before council today, so how can we approve? How can we approve the couple of dozen leases on here when we don't know how long they're for? Um, based on what Councillor Howard's given us, we could be approving a lease for one year for the Banyo Rugby Leagues Club, or it could be a hundred years. Um, so basic, common information that is essential for us. We are the 20. Well, it's not quite that many because the Lord Mayor's not here and a few other LNP councillors, but the 27 councillors are actually legally approving a lease, and we've not been told how long the lease is for. We've not been told how much the lease value is. Um, so there is a serious problem with the way that this is done, um, and uh, it's just not acceptable that we're not being given this basic information. And as I said, um, in past years, we would also always be given at least the term of the lease, um, and that's just stopped happening. So um, there are two big problems. One is the delay for groups, which causes them undue stress. 
uh, and two is the failure of this administration to provide the most basic leasing information so we can make an informed decision. Um, so, you know, most of these are four years, but we don't know. So when you go then and look at uh, item F, which is the lease for the Crushers Leagues Club, well, they're very special. Um, it's very clearly in here in its own capacity. Um, it's very clear that it's a 20-year lease. And councils uh, in here very much trying to talk about what a great outcome this is for the community. Um, well, fine. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that it's actually going to happen the way it happens. I think when councils overselling something, that's generally an in indication uh, that it's probably not as good as it first seems. Um, but that item clearly has terms. It has lease length. Uh, and it has details about what's going on. That's not information um, that uh, has been provided in the council papers today for us, and it should be um, as a matter of course um, for us to make a decision about whether we approve a lease. How long is that lease? I think is a pretty, pretty key thing. Uh, the proposed health, safety and amenity local law. Um, look, I think there might be some problems with what's going on here, but I'll have a, I'll have a good look at the uh, material when it comes through. Um, there is definitely a problem with fire pits and braziers. Um, without question, um, there are many people who suffer from asthma uh, and other respiratory diseases who are struggling with uh, Council's new rules. Um, and I know that we've logged a number of jobs for those people um, in recent months. Um, and I, I don't know, cars hasn't got back to us, of course, so I wouldn't know, but um, that's true. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Um, I, I don't know uh, what is and can be done. Um, smoke nuisance, particularly if you suffer from asthma, can be really, really difficult. Um, and Council's just um, given the green light to allowing um, you know, unfettered uh, fire pits. So I just think it's important that the balance is right with this. Um, I think uh, most people um, you know, are happy enough to see some changes, but it has to be done in a way um, that does not impact adversely on neighbours. And given that this administration has allowed subdivisions down to, you know, 120 square metres, um, you know, uh, you, you can pretty much be living immediately next to your neighbours. So if they've got a fire pit, it's in your house as well. So you do have to be really careful, um, you know, with this. Uh, uh, there is definitely a problem with swimming pools uh, and swimming pool fencing. Um, so we definitely need to sort that out. Um, and Oh, the traffic laws, sorry, that's item E. Um, I just noticed there are a number of increases to certain penalties here, and I'm not sure why what, some have been chosen and not others. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of consistency around why uh, there were certain increases. Um, my concern is that uh, Council does not necessarily enforce these um, as much as they could. Uh, particularly around sporting precincts, we have a fairly major problem with people parking on footpaths and parking across yellow lines and across driveways, and uh, particularly around schools. Um, I think the school enforcement project is not worth the paper it's written on anymore. They do not issue fines. What is the point of sending the inspectors out there if they're standing on the footpath waving to the people parked on the yellow line or double parked in the drop-off bay or doing U-turns over the zebra crossing or blocking a major road. Um, if the school enforcement team is to have um, any effect and value at all, it must issue fines. People know when the wrong thing is being done. Um, you know, uh, a few years ago, the big push was you must have a school management traffic management plan, and when you have a traffic management plan, we'll come out and enforce it. Well, that's not true. You ring and you log a job for someone to come out and enforce around a school, and you're immediately told, well, you can go on the list for the school enforcement program. So a year later, you might actually get some enforcement. So in my view, it's not the quantum of the penalty that is the problem. It is the lack of enforcement. Council officers have the power. Um, they should absolutely be um, taking that action around uh, schools now, uh, particularly, and certainly uh, for parking across driveways and, and yellow lines. So I would rather see Council's um, energies put into uh, taking more action. 
um, rather than uh, necessarily increasing the fine because um, you know the, the penalty units do go up. You get a $120 fine, that's pretty big, uh, or 130 I think it might be at the moment. But um, I'd certainly like to see more enforcement, particularly around schools. Um, it's important that they are very safe and around our major precincts in residential areas to help improve the amenity for residents. And this is where council goes out and does warnings when they should be doing enforcement. Further speakers, Councillor Adaman. Uh, thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on item G, the health, safety and amenity local law, and specifically in relation to the dumping of shopping trolleys and littering in our suburbs. Uh, the objective of this proposed local law change is in part to provide better clarity around the existing regulations for shopping trolleys and unsightly objects, materials and vegetation. Uh, Mr Chair, for reasons I can't explain, littering is a bigger issue in my community than it should be. I'm surprised by the number of calls we regularly rece uh, receive to the ward office about shopping trolleys left on footpaths or worse, in Cubler or Mogul Creek and advertising material and community newspapers dumped on front lawns, sometimes for days and weeks before property owners clean them up. We need to collectively take more pride in how our communities are presented, and I'm pleased that the Shrinner Council is showing the necessary leadership to provide more clarity around the relevant laws. Brisbane is an emerging city on the international stage, and now as the preferred city for uh, the 2032 Olympic Games, the world is watching and making judgments on everything we do and say. These amendments couldn't have come at a better time. They are necessary steps in ensuring how Brisbane will be perceived by visitors and an international audience of millions over the next 11 years. We are making some headway, as evidenced last week with Brisbane being named the 10th most livable city in the world ahead of Melbourne and Sydney. But these rankings can and do change, as we saw with Brisbane moving from 18th position to 10th in the space of 12 months. Having done the hard work, the Schrinner Council is determined to see this momentum continue and our livability rankings go, uh, go higher leading up to 2032. Uh, Mr Chair, we now have four major shopping centre precincts in the Pullen Vale Ward, two at Kenmore Chapel Hill, uh, one at Belbarry, and with the fourth opening at Mogul on the weekend. In regards to, uh, to the latter, I congratulate Consolidated Properties for recognising the current and potential growth of the Mogul and Belbarry communities and investing $45 million in a new centre, the first of its type in the area since 1973. The centre is underpinned by Coles as its major tenant and is a most welcome addition in my community. I appreciate that Coles, along with Woolworths and Aldi locally, have made genuine efforts over the years to address where shopping trolleys end up, but they still continue to disappear from the shopping centre precincts. As Councillor Mackay will attest, we saw four trolleys come back to, uh, from creeks and parks at Chapel Hill in the space of a few hours during the recent Clean Up Australia Day. I don't know if simply increasing the frequency of collection within the car parks areas will totally solve the problem. Ditto with self-regulation. The answer might well be having to confiscate trolleys or increase fines. I'll be keen to see what other ideas come from the consultation, particularly from those with the most to lose, the shopping centres themselves. The implementation of a self-assessable code for the distribu uh, distribution of printed materials appears to be a good start. Hopefully the days of drive-by dumpings are coming to an end and that distributors will be required to place materials and newspapers in letterboxes. And when it comes to residents requesting no junk mail, I hope the feedback from consultation calls on distributors to respect the wishes of property owners. Mr Chair, the Schrinner Council has a proud record when it comes to delivering the services and infrastructure that foster pride in where we live. Let's show through these amendments that we are leading the way in ensuring Brisbane becomes and remains the nation's most livable city. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on community facilities, and I find this um, uh, an interesting item that's going through, uh, through Council today with ENC, and uh, in a way it's uh, very disappointing for my local club, Marika Bowls Club, that they're not on this list, um, that they've actually been excluded. 
Uh, and I know my residents are very angry about this and certainly I'm pretty upset myself. That community facility, which Council owns, um, it has been vacant now for two years under this LMP administration. It's been vacant and deteriorating point of order, for two years. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Uh, point of order. Uh, point uh, of the order. Maruka Bowls yes, Club is not listed in this submission. It's still, it's still a community facility. Um, Sorry, look, other people. I, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, Councillor Griffiths, I will allow it. However, um, please, please. Keep in mind that it is not, in fact, listed on the list, but I will allow you to make some comments about Marika. Please yeah. continue. Thank you. And I, I do note that other councillors have spoken broadly about this topic as well. Um, yes, paragraph 15, paragraph 16. You, you, I know the I, LMP... I have provided thank you. an allowance. Yes, Please thank continue. You. Thank you. I do note the LMP don't want this discussion raised, but this is important to hear. It's important to be heard in the chamber. Certainly, how you voted last week is out there in the community, and it will continue to be out there in the community because it's important to know that the LNP don't support renewal or improvement of this facility. The leasing of this process has been ongoing now for two years, two years too long. It's, um, it's um, almost diabolical, the process Council has followed. So that um, there was a condition assessment report done in 2016 but that condition assessment report, which contained multiple, uh, multiple items that needed repair in the clubs, weren't given to the new lessees or the lessees when they were applying. A new condition audit report was given in 2020 that had been doctored without all the information on it from the 2016 report. The fact that this council is hiding information and I have written to Councillor Howard, I have written to the Lord Mayor, I have written to the CEO. The fact that Council is hiding information on the works required in our facilities so that we can hive that work off to not-for-profit organisations is wrong. Residents think order. it's wrong. Point of order, Councillor Howard. Um, Maruka Bowles Club cannot be listed on the submission because the lease was surrendered and it has gone to tender. So okay, it's thank not you. part of... Um, as I say, Councillor Griffiths, I have made an allowance for something that is not identified. Can I please ask you to come back to the specific yes. item at hand? Yes, please. I am coming back to Maruka Bowles Clubs. No, no, what? no, no, please come. I've, as I said, Maruka's not listed. I've allowed three minutes for something that's not listed but isn't generally included in what's been discussed. Please come back to the specifics. I, I find it appalling that we have a facility that is a community facility, and we are talking about community facilities, that, um, that was left over from the Commonwealth Games, a council community facility was left over from the Commonwealth Games, and we aren't maintaining it, we aren't improving it, and we're trying to give it to community organisations to run and pay for the bill for running this facility. I think it is wrong, and residents think it's wrong. It's, it's the way we are misusing... Council, so I have asked you to return to the specific item in front of us, and I must insist you do so. Please come back yeah, to I'm the Yeah, I'm coming item back here. to community facilities, the way community facilities are being mismanaged in this city, the way they are being uh, run so poorly with no resources put into them, very selectively looked after, depending on whether in an LMP ward or not, uh, is really shabby and a shabby reflection on, on this council and this administration and the poor way they are treating residents who don't vote for them. And I am astounded that point we of think... Order, Mr. Point, Chair. Of order, point of order to you, Councillor Adams. I believe Councillor not Adams. only is Councillor Griffiths totally ignoring your ruling, he's imputing motives on the councillors on this side of the chamber. This is a report about the lease of council lands and very specific names. Uh, Councillor Griffiths, I will have to insist that if you don't refer, return to the specifics of the report, I'll have to ask you to make these comments in general business. Yep. So please, um, please return to the substance of what's in front of us. Sure. And what I uh, want to conclude is that the mismanagement of our community facilities is being observed across this city, and it's disgusting, and the LMP should hang their heads in shame. Yep. Further speakers? Any further speakers? McLaughlin. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item E, the proposed changes to Chapter 14, Parking and Control Measures. Um, and I'd like to begin by making an apology. In my uh, enthusiasm to promote our concurrence with the state's state government's increases in fines for parking in 
disability spaces, uh, which no, no, for which nobody should have zero tolerance. I uh, made a mistake in an interview this morning on radio. I said that the measures were, were coming in um, almost immediately. In fact, they do have to go via the state government for the state government interest check. So it is a fact that if uh, our friends here on the other side want to block this measure, um, they can do so by lobbying their friends in William Street. Um, but uh, I gather that they actually do support the measure, uh, which, is in, which is to increase fines for those who park illegally in disability spaces. So I'm assuming that they actually will support it here. Uh, but the process is that after it passes through this place, it goes back to the state government, as all local law changes need to, uh, to get concurrence from the state government, and then it will be returned here. But uh, to the measure, uh, Mr Chair, this is, uh, uh, this is one, that is one of several measures that have been, um, that are, we're discussing here today, debating here today, which make it clear that illegal parking uh, on roads, uh, and in particular, in spaces that are reserved for disability spaces is untenable. Uh, those people who park illegally in clearway zones clearly should feel, full, should feel the full brunt of the law and a maximum penalty should be imposed, and that's what this does today. It looks uh, at some of the uh, 50 fines that can be imposed for illegal parking across the city. It makes changes to 17, uh, including the uh, increase in disability parking bay fines, uh, which is in, as I said, completely in accord with what the state government suggests. Uh, we're happy that they've introduced that measure and also extended it to people who are vision impaired as well, um, so that uh, those, uh, those who are rely on, um, on those parking spaces are able to do so when they go about their business. And that is the same too for people uh, who park illegally on footpaths, uh, they should feel, feel the full brunt of the law as well, and there's a, a commensurate increase in the fine for that uh, issue here going through today. So with that, Mr Chair, I commend it to the Chamber. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on items C and F. Um, well, Mr Chair, this, the item C is seeking Council's approval to renew lease agreements for community organisations at 24 council-owned sites. Those 24 council-owned sites are listed on the attachment. And this item relates to existing leases that are not going out to tender. So um, what we heard in the chamber before um, was total rubbish. Maruka Bowls Club cannot be listed on the submission because that lease was surrendered by the club. It has gone out to tender. A tender has been awarded and we are in the process of negotiating with that um, club now. If I can finish without being interrupted, and it's not two years, the, the issue is that Councillor Griffiths, please allow Councillor Howard to, to be heard. Councillor Howard. Um, through you, Mr Chair, I'm rising just to speak on the item C and what Councillor Griffiths is talking about is not included in item C. But I want to make it very clear and put it on the record. The Bowls Club surrendered the lease. It then went out to tender. The, the people who asked for the tender asked for it to be put on hold because of COVID. There's been COVID during that year. We have been, that lease was, um, that tender was finalised in January of this year. And only last week did we have the lessee complete the paperwork to allow the tender to keep, to keep pursuing. We're working very closely with them. If the local councillor would work with the people and work with the um, officers, we could certainly get through this a lot quicker. <laughs> Anyway, from that, let me just move to um, the actual item, which of course is seeking the approval to renew the lease agreements. That is all it's seeking to do. 
Um, we have to do that in accordance with section 217 of the City of Brisbane Regulation 2012. Council cannot enter into a valuable non-current asset contract um, without, without that happening. So therefore, item C is seeking Council's approval to apply the exemption set out in section 2661 of the regulation to renew these 24 community leases without going to tender. And you will see that many on that um, list are long-standing um, tenants of ours and, and we're working very closely with them for that to happen. So I'm pleased to hear that uh, it will be supported by the opposition and I commend it to the chamber. In relation to item F, the amendment of the lease to the Crushers Leagues Club, item F is seeking council's approval to update the lease conditions for the Crushers League Club to bring the definition of turnover in line with the definition used by the Office of Liquor and Gaming. The amendment does not change the terms of the minimum required community contributions outlined within their lease agreement. This simply corrects the definition of turnover to be consistent with the state legislation. And yet again, um, through you, Mr Chair, um, I know that Councillor Hammond has been working very, very closely with the Crushers League Club to to, uh, to try and, and get this uh, outcome, but you know, impeded by local, state, uh, Labor people who just don't want to help. I don't know what it is with the Australian Labor Party. We want to help all of our people get their leases and their paperwork and their their um, everything in order. But often. It's, it's people such as uh, the, the state ALP that stand in the way. So the Crushers Leagues Club, this, this brings to, um, this actually allows them to continue. It corrects that definition of the turnover, as I said, and of course I commend item F to the Chamber. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on item G, the proposed Health, Safety and Amenity Local Law 2021. Um, and as Acting EPS uh, Chair, I'll speak to the amendments relating to fire pits and braziers. And Councillor Marks uh, will speak to the broader package of amendments. Uh, Mr Chair, the Shrina Council is committed to making Brisbane suburbs even better. Last year during COVID lockdowns, residents were looking for more things to do close to home and in this case literally in their own backyard. We understood this and that's why we decided to take a more common sense approach to the use of fire pits as part of an initial trial in winter 2020. Uh, this trial allowed Brisbane to be in alignment with our neighbouring councils in South East Queensland, noting that we already allow these fires in our rural areas. After the trial concluded, we reviewed an enormous amount of feedback. We had 6,000 responses on Facebook, over 1,000 letters and emails and nearly 2,000 petition signatures. And Mr Chair, the feedback was overwhelmingly in favour of allowing backyard fire pits and braziers to continue. We received over 96 per cent support for allowing fire pits from over 7,000 respondents on Facebook. We had nearly 2,000 signatures on council petitions both for and against fire pits and nearly 95 per cent of the signatures were in favour. Even in the emails and letters, of which there were over 1,000, over two-thirds were in favour. Following the strong support for the trial, we announced that the relaxed restrictions would remain in place until a review of the health, safety and amenity local law could be completed, uh, and we are looking at that proposal here today. Under the previous local law, backyard burning of any kind, apart from the specific purpose of cooking food, was not legally permitted except in rural areas. Under the proposed amendment, residents in suburban areas may have a small, safe fire in a fire pit or brazier raised off the ground for the purpose of heating or social gatherings. The condition is that residents do not create smoke impacts for their neighbours. Various provisions in the amendment are proposed in order to minimise the creation of smoke. To reduce smoke, residents should only use dry, clean, untreated wood or smokeless fuels such as gas, ethanol or charcoal. Further measures to reduce smoke include the requirement for the use of purpose-built fire pits and braziers in which the fire is not in direct contact with the ground. This is because when burning wood, a fire that is sunk into the ground or surrounded by a wall does not have enough airflow to prevent smoke. 
The proposed law does not permit the use of unsuitable containers, such as reused chemical drums, for backyard fires. Uh, Mr Chair, Councillor Cunningham met with KidSafe uh, and the Lung Foundation uh, and did take their concerns seriously, which is why we partnered with KidSafe to produce a fire pit safety video and have provisions in the local law which prohibit creating a smoke impact. We have worked very hard to strike the right balance with the proposed local law, and we welcome submissions from residents and other stakeholders. Thank you. Yeah, just very briefly, uh, Mr Chair, we're talking about increasing fines. Of course, fines depend on the wealth of the person that's uh, being fined. It's, it's nothing for a multimillionaire to be able to pay a fine. Uh, but it's a substantial burden on low income earners and in many cases with low income earners it ends up them spending time in, in prison to, uh, to, as it was, was called, pay off the fine. And so I think the council should take an innovative approach and approach the state government for permission to means test fines, take into account, take into account the wealth levels of the person being fined and have a different scale of fees for wealthy people compared to low income earners. Or so, and uh, I think that would be a fine initiative for this council to take. Thank you. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor Marks. Thank you, Mr Chair. I arrive briefly to speak on item E, the parking, and item G, the hassle um, laws. So, firstly, through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Johnson, the um, school parking um, about making officers or wanting officers to go out there and actually find um, people who are doing the wrong thing. I, I, I don't disagree. I think that everyone needs to know that at the first approach with all council officers, are cars particularly, it's about education. So we want to educate people who are doing the wrong thing and then if they continue to do the wrong thing, then absolutely fines will be issued. Um, the, issue, the, the other side of that coin, of course, is then we get accused, as we have already tonight, been accused of revenue raising. Um, and interestingly, through you, Mr Chair, Councillor Cummings just comment then about means testing for people. Um, for doing the wrong thing in parking fines, etc. Um, the reality is very simple. If you don't want to get a fine, don't do the crime. It's as simple as that. Don't park illegally. Don't park on a yellow line. Like you know, I. Point of order, Chair. I, Point of order, Councillor Shree. Uh, I, I get what Councillor Marks means, but would Councillor Marks take a quick question? Councillor Marks, we take sure. a question. Yep, hang on. Cal yes, Councillor. Thanks. Three years, Councillor Marks. I mean, I, I guess the problem is that a, a very rich person can still park in the disabled parking bay and just say, oh, I'll just pay the fine or take the risk of the fine. I, 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 can, I don't understand what is your... Three, you had the question, please. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just halfway through this. I, I don't understand why means-tested fines is seen as so outrageous. It's, it's well, that wasn't, that wasn't what was discussed. Councillor Marks. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, as I said, you don't do the crime, you, you don't get the fine. It's as simple as that. I myself got a parking fine because I parked in a, in a, in a clearway, which I misread the information on the sign. It was a $150 fine. Actually, no, I think it was 220 You know, I just had to suck it up and pay it because I did the wrong thing. So that's the reality of, of life. It's just like speeding. If you speed, you're going to get a speeding fine. Um, and, you know, that's the reality. That's the world we live in. Um, as far as item G and the hassle, um, laws we talked about. Councillor Johnson mentioned swimming pools. This is exactly what this law that we're talking about um, is, is to do, introduce. Um, those of you may remember Councillor Shree through you, Mr Chair, bringing it up in chambers last week. He had an issue with a, um, a, a site which had a, a swimming pool um, that was definitely not what we call compliant with their local amenity. Um, and these are about giving officers more opportunity and benefit to deal with this stuff so that the people who get the first warning um, and then if they continue to do the wrong thing, the fines will increase exponentially. The other th th thing that we, um, Councillor Shree through you, Mr Chair, talked about was the, the camping or sleeping cars, so to speak. So just to give you a little bit of a background history, where we are right at this moment is a resident can ring and complain or contact the contact centre, make a complaint that someone is sleeping, camping, whatever, in their car in front of their house, say along the riverfront. The officers can go out there and see that somebody's there. They could potentially even be setting up um, a washing line and hanging out their washing and all that sort of stuff and basically setting up camp. They have no capacity to do anything or say anything to that person until they've actually slept overnight. 
So they then go back in the morning and then the person is there, they can then do something about it. This is about changing it and being more proactive. So if a resident, and I might add, all these complaints that come through to compliance are complaint driven. So if a resident rings and says there's somebody sleeping in the car outside my, my house, an officer can come along and they can speak to the person and they can quite clearly see if there's an, an emergent issue, as in homeless or um, situations like that. You've got to give credit to our council officers. You know, they, they do have compassion. They're not going to go jumping and making issues for people um, off the top of their back. I know that there was a request for us to be more prescriptive as far as what the laws can say and, and do. But the reality is local laws just cannot be so prescriptive like that. I agree, I would like it as well, but then the local law would be probably 50 pages long. So, and I don't have any legal background at all, and this is when we're talking about local laws, we talk about we have the legal team who work very hard with us to make these things as clear-cut, but as prescriptive as they can possibly do within the situation. Point, point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Shree. Sorry to interrupt again. Will Councillor Marks just take a Councillor quick Marks, question? Marks, take a question. I'm, I'm actually trying to get through some stuff that I know Councillor you... I'm, Marks I'm happy to chat to you offline. To decline. Councillor Marks. Yeah, so that's what I just wanted to explain, the fact that Council Officers, what they're dealing with at the moment and that we're trying to do. The other thing that was mentioned about backpackers sleeping in cars in industrial areas. Well, you know what? The reality is nobody's potentially going to complain about that. Officers don't drive around looking for people sleeping in the cars. They've got far better things to do. Um, it's complaint driven. So if someone rings up and makes a complaint, that's when they can go out and investigate. And emergent can be anything. You know, I could have an argument with my husband and decide I don't want to sleep at the house that night and go and sleep in the car somewhere. I'm not homeless, but I've got an emergency with my husband, don't want to sleep at home. No, no, Sorry, I'm not allowed to say no. that. Apologies. No, no, got to take it back. Apologies. I'll take that back. <laughs> yes. I'm cranky. Yes, yeah, better. Um, and, and do you know what I mean? So there's an emergent situation that doesn't mean to say I'm homeless, but so you, you can't be prescriptive for everything that why someone would want to sleep in a car. So it's, like I said, you've got to give council officers the, um, the, the reality that they do have compassion and give them credit for um, making the right decisions. Thank you. Further speakers? Any further speakers? We'll now put the resolutions B through H. All those in favour of B through H, please say aye. aye. And those against, please say no. no. The ayes have it. We might have a... Yeah, packing up, ready to go. <laughs> Point. Mm. Point of order, Can Chair. Point of order, Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councils have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton. To this Council now adjourn for a period of 15 minutes for the purpose of afternoon tea, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Thank you, councillors. Welcome back, councillors. Welcome back. We have quorum. Can I please call on the Lord Mayor to move items A and I, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Item A, the amendment to administrative arrangements was subject to a, a councillor briefing uh, today. Uh, so I have no doubt that those who are interested in learning more about this uh, went along to that briefing. Uh, this is um, something that we, going forward, plan to do every year at about this time. And uh, we will be making adjustments to the structure of the organisation uh, to make sure that we can provide better services to the people of Brisbane that we represent. And so uh, our intent here um, is to make sure that service delivery continues to improve, continuous improvement. And that means um, some changes from time to time in the structure of, of the organisation. Um, and so this will be a matter of making those adaptations. I know that one of the biggest ambitions when it comes to this particular, uh, uh, I guess, um, proposal going forward 
is um, improvements to the way that Councillor Mark's area uh, will work going forward. Uh, and in particular, improve it to service delivery for residents and councillors as well. So changing the structure um, to better suit the needs of the community is the aim. Uh, this is not something that will generate a uh, reduction in staff numbers, but will involve some transfers from one section of council to another. Uh, and there's certainly no increase in executive numbers to accommodate these changes either. Uh, to the final item, which is uh, the family friendly hours submission. <clears throat> this is something I flagged recently. Now, what we're doing, just to be clear here, is we're changing the start time of the meeting from 2 p.m. to 1 p.m. Now, there's various things that had to be considered with this. Obviously, it is our intent to make sure that councillors can meet their uh, both work obligations and family obligations. Uh, and uh, obviously, the way that we're hosting this particular meeting, as we have in recent times, shows that that is possible with the hybrid arrangement in place. Uh, but one of the things that uh, we have uh, done a lot of work on is to look at um, the length of council meetings and without seeking to shorten those meetings um, to provide an opportunity for an earlier finish for councillors so that they can either meet family commitments or work commitments or community commitments. And so uh, whether you are in the boat of having young children or not, um, you'll also be able to go to your local PNC meeting. I don't know, you're all excited about that. Um, or to a local neighbourhood watch group meeting um, or to another community commitment that you might have on a Tuesday. As you know, at the moment, um, it is often the case that we have to refuse um, community commitments on a Tuesday because often the time that we finish is, um, means that it's often a bit too late for us to get there. And, uh, and some meetings go different lengths than others. This simple change will bring forward the meeting time from 2 p.m. to 1 p.m. It won't uh, put any kind of restriction on the amount of democratic debate that can be held. So there's no limit on the time a meeting um, can take. If it takes longer, it takes longer. But given the historic length of council meetings, which on average is between five and six hours in length, so if you go back, uh, looking at how long council meetings actually take uh, without limitation, uh, generally between five and six hours. So with that in mind, moving them forward uh, means that we finish um, on average at a, more at a more acceptable time that allows us to meet other commitments as well. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Shree. Will the Mayor take a very good question? May we take a question? Sure. Uh, yes, please it, proceed. Thanks. Does this include shifting the dinner break an hour earlier? Lord Mayor. Yeah, uh, look, that's a fair question. So um, uh, traditionally, uh, we would uh, break at about seven o'clock, give or take. Um, and um, uh, under the earlier start time, that would mean that dinner would usually happen at about six o'clock, so under the new proposal. Um, but obviously, dinner um, is one of those things. Sometimes we have it, sometimes we don't, depending on the length of the meeting. Uh, and so, uh, the other change that we'll see coming through here is the shift in, the, uh, in one of the committee times where the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee will be moved from an 11.30 a.m. start forward to an 8.30 a.m. start. Um, so that there's some, there's some objections to that, I, I hear. Um, <laughs> um, Councillor Marks. Um, and that will provide sufficient break between the last committee meeting and the beginning of the council meeting. Um, so that's the reason that change has been made. Uh, so as I said, there's no restriction on the length of time that a council meeting can take. That's not being proposed. Um, and looking at that historical record, between five and six hours is the average um, over a long period of time. And uh, it'll hopefully mean that um, councillors can meet their other commitments on a Tuesday evening as well, whether they be work or family commitments. Um, so pretty straightforward change, um, which I see some potential positives can come out of, but I don't really see any downsides that would come out of this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks, Chair. Can I just ask that uh, A and I be taken seriatim for voting, please? For voting? Separate for voting. Yes, thanks. Please, please proceed. Uh, so the amendment to the administrative arrangements uh, now come just six months after the administrative arrangements 
um, were last changed uh, in this place here. Uh, so it is strange that after just six months, uh, the last review or whatever process in which ENC goes through, uh, to change those administrative arrangements, we um, have them fiddling around again uh, when basic services in the community um, are not being focused on. So instead of restoring those community services that they've cut, like curbside collection, uh, and public transport, and instead of fixing uh, thousands of kilometres of broken footpaths, Chair, what we have here is the LNP administration and ENC uh, control, basically controlling the flow of information to elected representatives. And that's what became clear uh, today in that briefing that was held, uh, that uh, no, longer, no longer can uh, local uh, councillors or elected representatives elected by their communities to advocate on their behalves have a uh, a direct relationship and a direct line of communication with uh, people in uh, asset services. And they now have to go through uh, a, 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 a client, uh, what, what is it, account manager, that was the term, an account manager, uh, now to, um, to progress the most basic of council work, work like um, uh, fixing broken and dangerous footpaths in our suburbs and drainage issues and waterway issues. Uh, and it's quite clear that this, this is uh, one uh, we hope would be an unintended consequence of what the Lord Mayor is proposing, uh, if not a deliberate attempt uh, at controlling uh, what a local councillor can and cannot do on behalf, uh, on behalf of their community. And when, when the LNP uses terms like streamlining, uh, we know that that is just code uh, for getting rid of in-house uh, workers and contracting those jobs out. And we know that this has happened time and time again. Uh, under uh, restructures of divisions uh, and the way in which work is carried out under successive LNP administrations. We see uh, less and less of those asset services officers doing that work uh, and more and more labour hire uh, and contract and casual workers coming in uh, and doing it. So uh, I, going on past performance of this Lord Mayor and administrations he has been a part of, um, I don't buy what he says when he says this won't result uh, in the change of work working conditions uh, and jobs for council workers. Uh, Chair, there really isn't a job, there really isn't a job uh, or a worker here in council that this Lord Mayor <laughs> doesn't want to see as disposable. And just on, Further. Just on item uh, I, uh, Chair, um, uh, these are, is a very, very small change and the Lord Mayor uh, crowed a lot about um, these family-friendly hours, but it, it, um, the sum total of this is uh, changing the meeting time by one hour uh, and a committee meeting being moved around, uh, so there really isn't much substantive change in, in Clause I. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Sorry, Councillor Cook. I'll, go, I'll be quick. I rise to speak on item A and item I. Uh, firstly, and just briefly with respect to item I, the Family Friendly Council Standing Committee meeting commencement times, um, this is a triumph of spin over substance. Uh, there is very little done here to actually make um, things more family friendly. And if I heard the Lord Mayor correctly, he's saying we're still going to go to a dinner break at six o'clock. Now, the reason the dinner break was put in at six o'clock was for the council staff so that they could have a break as part of their work. So if he's saying they're no longer having a break, um, fair enough. I've always been an advocate of council should be swapping them out if they're here for a very long period of time and others um, should be rostered to come in. Um, but it does not help anybody um, simply to move things one hour forward. That is not being family friendly. The really simple, easy thing to do here uh, would be to put committees on one day and put council on the next day. Um, that is no real hardship to anybody here. We can all get here very easily. Um, and it would make it so much better for everybody who has a range of other commitments. Um, both through the day and in the evening to accomplish those commitments. Um, so this is really a lost opportunity. It is certainly not about making it family friendly. Um, I note that it extends, I don't have little children, but it extends my day by some hours. Not makes it better, it makes it actually worse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Councillors, please allow the speaker to be heard in silence. Councillor Johnston. Yeah, well, the Lord Mayor and the Deputy Mayor are interjecting, but let me be clear. Um, the committee that I attend is at 11.30. It's being moved to 8.30 in the morning. That's going to increase the length of my day by three hours. 
Uh, so, I know. I'm just, I'm just passing. I'm just passing an obs. I'm just. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Shree. I just want to draw your attention to the repeated interjections from other councillors and ask thank that you. Thank you. I've called for silence. Be consistent. I am, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the Lord Mayor, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, yeah, Councillor Johnston. But they're please, not named. Please. They're not named by name. Um, so, look, I'll just say that this is a lost opportunity, and uh, really the Lord Mayor is just stumbling around the edges here. He's trying to look like he's doing something without actually doing anything constructive. And if we're just going to go off to a dinner break at six o'clock, that means we come back at seven o'clock. No one can still get to their meetings at seven or seven thirty. So it defeats the purpose. This needed a wholesale change and it would have been a good opportunity to do so. Where there has been wholesale change um, with outrageously um, uh, inappropriate outcomes is in item A, the amendments to the administrative arrangements. Now, some of them are window dressing, to be fair. Community facilities and venues is now called community facilities. That's not anything to really worry about. Um, but where the big changes are happening is the abolition of asset services, which has been a major part of field services in the 13 years that I've been here at Council. The wholesale changes that are proposed to the engine room of Council service deliveries are not supported. Let me be clear, this is a terrible retrograde step. Um, the new councillors who are here haven't been here long enough to understand what this is going to do, but they will find out the hard way. And the uh, longer serving councillors who are in charge of this um, clearly have been, um, I think, led by the bureaucracy to an outcome that will not serve us and will not serve the community. Um, this council is implementing a huge amount of central control through this process that it outlined uh, earlier today. Um, gone are the local regions uh, where we had officers who were accountable for all range of service delivery that we spoke to on a daily basis. And it's certainly very clear the intention of this council is to force us, force us to deal with somebody called an account manager. An account manager, like we're some customer of some dodgy bank that's you know, being sent offshore or something. Let's be clear. Section 171 of the City of Brisbane Act says we can talk to council employees. Uh, so for those listening up there in George Street, um, that process will not work. We are entitled to speak to council officers about the services uh, and the issues that come up in the course of our responsibilities in carrying out our roles. And the attempt by this council to divert us to some sort of PR or communications response is not acceptable. It's not acceptable. Um, the, the, the biggest issue that this council has on a governance uh, point of view is that it is too big. It lacks, it lacks a sense of community, of connection to community. And where it had that through its service delivery, it is now killing it by centralising control in geographic areas that are defined as north and south, or under civil north and south, or whatever it might be. Centralising, uh, centralising functions uh, is not a way to deliver better customer service. It's not. Now, let's be clear. Um, that's not going to lead to better outcomes for us as councillors or uh, council officers, because uh, sorry, for our constituents. So if you have a problem now, you can usually talk to an arborist, whether you're me or whether you're Mrs Smith in Chelmer. Um, that's all going to stop. So the constituents who ring up and want advice um, aren't going to be able to talk to somebody who's making the decision or the expert in the field. They're going to get an admin person who will read out something. And I can tell you now that the gobbledygook that comes out of that place sometimes is very difficult to understand. The minute that you disconnect service delivery agencies from their customers, you lose good customer service outcomes. And that is what this administration is doing. And on top of that, I note earlier today that there was, a, and they said this very publicly, there are no cuts to staff. So we'll hold them to that. But what they are making council officers do is reapply for their jobs. Pretty much all their jobs have been cut. There's going to be new titles, new roles, and they have to reapply for their own jobs. They're going to have to compete against others for a similar type of job. It may involve a pay cut. 
So what do we think is going to happen when, when thousands of council officers are out there trying to apply for a job um, that they've been doing successfully for the last decade or more, many of them for 30 or 40 years? What's going to happen? Do you think they're going to be anxious? Do you think they're going to be worried? Do you think they're going to be focused on um, getting their job? Or do you think they're going to be focused on fixing the footpath and the road or the drain or the park? This is a triumph of bureaucracy over common sense. It is shocking that Council have done both of these items today without any discussion with us. I mean, we councillors, the 27 of us, are pretty good at giving feedback when it comes to the operational service delivery of this council. Did anybody think maybe to talk to us to say, hey, what do you think? How do you think this might work? No. What about the family-friendly council sittings? Was there any kind of discussion? Hey, councillors, what do you think? This is what we're thinking. Do you think maybe they could have talked to us about this? No. This is about top-down command and control by an organisation that is flaming out and is letting the bureaucracy run riot over the top of them. And the losers are the people of Brisbane who aren't going to see better customer service out of this. Um, they're going to get a uh, gobbledygook from an account manager, not a discussion with the arborist about a tree out the front of their house. And I'll finish with this. We were told um, that this process was all about making sure that there was centralised and streamlined delivery of services. So when I asked why the suburban enhancement projects were being handled by one team and not by the civil team who were handling all the capital works projects, the executive manager couldn't tell me. Could not tell me. So according to this council, there's a whole separate structure to deliver projects that councillors have requested versus projects that the Lord Mayor has put in the budget. Yet the same, the same process applies to them both. They're both playgrounds delivered in parks. They're both footpaths delivered in parks. So here we have separate structures in separate silos when the whole point of this is to streamline. When I asked the question, there was no reply. And I'm still waiting on the reply. Here we are again, having the debate without the information that I asked for earlier today. That's how this council rolls. There is no way this is going to result in better customer service delivery. Um, and interestingly enough, the Lord Mayor says he's going to do this every year. Good luck with that. Um, you have been doing it at least once or twice a year for the last 13 years. Um, you haven't really touched asset services other than the, the name change to field services and a few other things. Um, but this council goes out with such fanfare and claims that it's making all these great changes for customer service, and all they're doing um, is just changing some names, um, making it harder for good people to do their jobs, forcing them to apply for roles that are, you know, who knows how they're all going to be structured, um, and making it harder for the residents of Brisbane Councillor and councillors to do their jobs. Councillor Johnston, your time has expired. Further speakers? Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I rise to speak on Clause I, Family Friendly Council and Standing Committee meeting commencement times. Mr Chair, last year I met with the Lord Mayor and the CEO of Council to discuss a range of matters related to making Council more accessible and family friendly. Of those things we discussed uh, was hybrid Council meetings, which I'm very pleased to, of course, see implemented in this place. And for those of you uh, reading the transcript after this meeting today, I am participating in Council today via the hybrid model, um, as I have a four-month-old baby. And the hybrid model makes the difference between my ability to participate today or not. Another thing we discussed was parental leave for councillors and amendments to be made to the standing orders to allow for councillors to take a period of time away from the chamber and not requiring an apology to be made. Again, for the people at home, if an apology is not made for a councillor or an apology is not accepted by the chamber over consecutive meetings, then the person will be removed from their position on that committee, uh, as happened to me over uh, my maternity break, or as a councillor full stop. That's pretty serious consequences, Mr Chair. A few weeks ago, I moved a motion in this chamber seeking that we introduce parental leave for councillors, given there had been no action from the mayor on this issue. The LNP councillors in this place voted no. They didn't support parental leave for councillors. Every single LNP councillor in this place and the Lord Mayor voted no. Which brings me to family-friendly sitting hours, which I also raised with the Mayor and CEO of Council when we met last year. 
I asked at that time that they undertake some analysis of how long the average council meeting was and consider splitting council and committees across two days. At that time, they indicated they were open to the prospect but asked for further details on what was proposed. There was some uh, toing and froing between the mayor and councillor Cassidy as leader of the opposition um, on that issue about what was proposed. But ultimately, uh, the mayor decided that he would not support council meetings and committee meetings across two days. So you can imagine, uh, Mr Chair, my surprise, pleasant surprise, when a few weeks ago I asked a question about what the mayor of this city, Adrian Schrinner, planned to do to support greater flexibility and participation, particularly for new parents as councillors in this place. And he announced that he would be introducing family-friendly sitting hours. Hooray! Wonderful. We didn't know the details, but the commitment that was there to make a change. I was excited to hear the detail. Would we finally see some real change today? We have found out the detail of that change. We have just heard uh, from the mayor, uh, we've heard from Councillor Cassidy, uh, we've heard from Councillor Johnston. Uh, one hour, we're moving the meeting forward by one hour from 2 p.m. to 1 p.m. So now councillors in this place will sit um, on average from around 8.30 a.m. in the morning to around maybe 7 p.m. Uh, on Tuesdays, taking into consideration meal breaks. I was asked what I thought about the proposal um, from a range of people once it was announced, and uh, the changes, uh, can I say, the one word that came to mind um, was underwhelming. Like much this mayor does and the LNP administration, there is no genuine commitment to creating a more inclusive council. It's a token gesture to be able to say that they have done something. That something is moving the meeting forward by one hour. This change comes from the same mayor who I asked last year uh, for a change table and nappy disposal unit to be placed in close proximity to the council chamber for use uh, by councillors, and staff who have caring responsibilities. Uh, we've checked that again today. Sadly, no change table, no nappy disposal unit has been installed. That's not just underwhelming, it's shameful that we can't even provide basic facilities for parents and employees in City Hall. What hope is there for other parts of the city? So that got me thinking, Mr Chair, about how many council public toilets have change tables or nappy disposal units or sanitary disposal units. Uh, not enough because those basic facilities are not a priority for this mayor. Uh, you can't even find out that sort of information on the council website. Um, some toilets have none. No sanitary disposal, no nappy disposal, no uh, change tables. One of the busiest parks in my local area, uh, Bulimba Riverside Park in Bulimba, uh, there Councilor are none Cook. of those things Councilor in Cook, those I toilets. Appreciate your building an argument. Uh, perhaps Councilor even more Cook, concerning, uh, Mr Chair, me? is no. that no, I don't think she can hear me. accessible change facilities are only available at six out of more than 2,000 local parks. Um, Mr Chair, I was pleased today to see that there was the analysis presented um, in relation to council meetings that I did ask for. Uh, so that information has been uh, given not by the mayor. Uh, I think it was handed out by his uh, media team to the media before today's meeting. Uh, the Brisbane Times reported that over the past six financial years, two thirds of meetings were finished within five hours and 22% ran for longer than 5.5 hours. This gives more weight, Mr Chair, for consideration to be given to committees and council to be split over two days. Both could commence at 8.30 or 9 a.m. and be finished around lunchtime, allowing councillors to return to their offices and complete their business there. That, Mr Chair, would be genuine family-friendly sitting hours. Instead, we have the same underwhelming response from this LNP mayor and LNP council. Token gestures of little substance. I shouldn't be surprised, Mr Chair, this Lord Mayor can't even get a change table and nappy disposal unit installed, let alone implement genuine family-friendly sitting hours in this place. So, Mr Chair, um, 
I'd like to now actually move the suspension of standing orders to allow me to move an urgency motion. Uh, yep. I seconded. All right. There's an urgency motion proposed by Councillor Cook that's seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Would you mind reading the resolution, please? Thank you. The Brisbane City Council urgently implement a public toilet strategy for the city. And you're distributing that electronically now? Thank you. It should be with you. Thank you. All right. Uh, three minutes to urgency. P a point of order. Can we just wait until we've got it? I couldn't. I. There right. was something uh, about public toilets, but we need to hear the motion, please. Uh, I don't mind. Look, uh, Councillor Cook, just bear with us while we distribute that to everybody. There is a mild, there is a mild lag in sometimes in your stream. Um, it is being distributed now. Councillor Cook, please proceed. Three minutes. Thank you, Mr Chair. Public toilets uh, serve many functions. Obviously, they are essential for health, um, but also planning for public toilets is about accessibility and inclusion in our city. You've just heard um, that some of our toilets don't have sanitary or nappy disposal units or change tables. There are only six out of 2,000 local parks with accessible adult change facilities. Six out of 2,000 local parks. That is appalling. Um, what has happened to um, the City of Brisbane under this LNP Council administration uh, and their priorities are all wrong. It is urgent because it's become clear that there isn't a plan uh, for public toilets in our city, or if there is a plan, it's failing dismally. This is urgent because public toilets in the city appear to be built on a site-by-site -site basis rather than a planned network considering accessibility, uh, travel and other issues which needs to change. This is urgent because other cities have implemented changes like the City of Sydney uh, in their 2014 public toilet strategy which aim to have facilities within 400 metres of any point within central Sydney. Uh, the City of Perth has also launched a 15-year public toilet strategy. Uh, this is urgent because currently there are a lack of toilets in locations where they ought to be provided. Uh, busy parks where councillors are asked to fund those sorts of facilities out of their own uh, suburban enhancement funds, which in some cases would take up all of those funds are in one toilet block. These are essential council facilities that ought to be audited and provided by council. Uh, our city is growing and we need more amenities. This is urgent because basic facilities are not being provided in our public toilets. Hooks on the back of doors for luggage, a shelf if you need to use medication in the toilet, uh, baby seats in the corner so you don't have to carry them whilst using the toilet, sanitary disposal units, nappy disposal units, change tables. The, Council, these are Councilor all Cook. additions that could be added if we had uh, better Cam guidance Cook. and a strategy to review what we presently have in our city. So I ask all councillors uh, to support the motion today that Brisbane City Council urgently implement a public toilet strategy. I'll now put this on the matter of urgency. All those who believe it to be urgent, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. No. The noes have it. Division, Division called Division. by Councillor Strunk and Councillor uh, Cassidy. Please ring the bells. Councillors, on the matter of urgency, all those who believe this matter to be urgent, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. 
Clarks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 18 against. The matter has been determined not urgent. Are there any other speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor Marks. I'm just waiting for it to reset, Chair, and it's not Your timer will be reset. There you go. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you, Mr Chair. So I'm arising to speak on item A. Over the past few months, Field Services has begun the process of transitioning to the new name of City Standards. And in March of this year, Matt Anderson was appointed as Executive Manager of City Standards. Now, the changes proposed within the administrative ranges um, aim to simplify the way we go about business and to improve outcome for our customers, customers being councillors and residents. To that end, there will be some realignment occurring across the business in coming months, some small, some more significant. And as part of this process, the following branch names will change to better reflect the role they will play in city standards. Urban amenities will become public space operations. Asset services will become program planning and integration. Now, this process is about improving processes and outcomes, not about reducing staff numbers. This is a structural realignment to ensure we are doing what is needed to improve delivery efficiency. And some of the more significant changes occurring within city standards over the coming months will be things like the Botanic Gardens team, as in Mount Cuthra and City Botanic, will move from program planning and integration into the public space operations, which is actually what they're all about. And most of the arbicultural functions within program planning and integration will move also to public space operations. While there will be some changes to the way we've operated in the past, it's important that we harness the opportunity to shape the new city standards. These changes will provide role clarity to each branch with delivery areas focused on in-year delivery. In addition to this, program planning and integration will focus on building the schedule of works for the next two to four years, prioritising future year projects and listings. Now, these movements and realignments have been carefully considered, and by making these changes now, we'll enable city standards to be clear, focused and proactive in delivering outcome for our customers. I think also it's very mindful, um, Acting Chair, that people, councillors in this room need to give council officers for the credit for the ability to do their job. Um, regardless of how they were asked to do that. Now, with respect through you, Deputy Chair, to the answer to Councillor Johnson's question, I have it here and I'm happy to read it out. Construction branch currently groups teams with certain skill sets to ensure that the delivery of projects is achieved in an efficient manner, irrespective of whether they were major or minor capital works. This includes staff who are engaged in the delivery of construction branches' contributions to SAF projects. With the establishment of city standards, the CEF team will be the coordination point for delivery of CEF projects for construction. Construction has internal delivery cap capability to deliver work ranging from concrete pathways and car parks to lighting and electoral work. This will be coordinated with external delivery by this team to effectively deliver these projects. During the transition, staff who are currently located within Asset Services Branch and who contribute to CEF projects will be aligned with those existing construction branch staff who also contribute to these projects. This is reflective of the importance that city standard places on these projects and is intended to ensure that delivery is not affected by the organisation restructure. I also have um, answers to, in respect to Councillor Strunk's question, which um, I'm not sure if you would like me to read that out now or happy to. So basically, Councillor Strunk's question was about the asset services categorises parks and subsequently assigns maintenance servicing frequencies using the criteria detailed below. So, a specialised high profile. So parks that are maintained by resident gardens such as City Botanic Gardens, New Said Park, Rocks Riverside or are significant, they may include areas of high horticultural importance, have historical importance, attract visitors across the city and international areas, high visitor usage, unusual infrastructure and high risk or consequent for non-visitations. And I think we can all agree that the parks that were named as those specialised high profile certainly fit within that criteria. The next category down we have is high profile. And those are foreshore parks and formalised parks that have a river frontage, they fall under this category. And they may include formalised gardens, attract visitors from across the city and regions, include major playgrounds, significant picnic areas, toilets and other unique infrastructure, and parking is usually formalised. 
We then go down to the more par general parks, which most of us councillors would have in our ward. These are ones that have basic facilities and generally service a suburb. So they attract visitors from across the region and more usually just the local suburb. They have play areas, barbecue facilities. They may or may not have toilets and then they have the informal gardens. We then move down to the low profile park, which we basically call the um, uh, just a service park in the area and it's got very basic facilities that just may have a small playground with limited seating. It may or may not have a barbecue with bins, concrete path. And they're usually the parks that are amongst the suburbs and used mainly by local neighbourhood um, residents. And then of course we have the biennials which speaks for itself. So I hope those answer the questions that the two councillors asked in this morning's briefing. Um, and I leave the rest of the debate for the Chamber. Thank you. Point of Thank order, you, Mr Councilor Chair. Mark. Point of order. Point of order comes on. Um, could Councillor Strunk just check on Councillor Cumming? He just appears a bit fatigued. <laughs> it's not a valid point of order, Councillor Owen. Thank you. Uh, any further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. Um, just briefly on the two items. I'm probably not quite as critical of the administration in, when it comes to the family friendly hours um, change. I, I think it's a common sense shift to start the meeting an hour early. Uh, I, I would suggest to the mayor that it's not necessary to go to dinner at six and maybe it, I guess you'll have to look at the workplace arrangements for staff but perhaps we can keep the dinner break at seven yeah. and that way we can we can just push right through and get some of those meetings finished so I'd be interested to hear from the mayor in his concluding remarks whether um, indeed that's a rule that's imposed by shift requirements and or whether it's open to us as an as a council to change that um, yeah I think I'd, I'd probably not the only councillor who, who thinks we should just keep the dinner break at seven and still start at one. Um, I do agree though with other um, councillors on, on this side of the chamber that it would have been better to make some more significant changes to the meeting structure and, and I personally would have much rather see the committee meetings happen on one day of the week, of the week and then the full council meetings happen on another day of the week. Um, I understand that there are arguments for and against that and I get particularly for councillors who live further out from the city, it's, it's more of a chore to travel into the inner city, so I don't want to um, underplay or discount that. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's been very frustrating that the council committee meetings only run for half an hour each. It, it means that they often just function as rubber stamping bodies where no substantive decisions can be made and no meaningful discussion can occur because there's so little time allowed. Um, and it often makes me wonder why those committees even exist because solid 20 minutes plus gets taken up by a presentation and then there's only a few minutes left for general business and other matters. So I, I guess the challenge I'd throw down to the Lord Mayor and the Deputy Mayor is that if, if you want those committees to be seen as meaningful and, and to be taken seriously by not just the councillors but the general public, maybe it would be better to allow a bit more time for them. Um, every time I've raised concerns about how short those committee meetings are and how little time is allowed for general business, the consistent reply has been um, we, we need to keep them short so that there's enough time for the full council meeting later in the day. And I just don't think that's a satisfactory argument. I think it would be much better to, if, if we want to have longer committee meetings, which I think we should, um, have them on one day and have the full council meetings on another day of the week. That seems to make a lot more sense um, just as a general proposition. And if there are some councillors for whom it's too difficult to travel into the inner city two days in a week, then they can participate in those committee meetings remotely and I don't think that will hurt anyone too significantly. Um, I do want to emphasise as well that I think uh, one element of making meetings more family friendly and accessible would be to ensure that the, they're live streamed because the, I understand that councillors can participate remotely now by a video link and that's good, but um, the ability to for certainly to for, for me as a councillor it's nice sometimes to be able to duck into another committee meeting and and watch what's been discussed in the infrastructure committee or the city planning committee or other committees that that i have an interest in even though i'm not represented on them and through you chair to the lord mayor i i, I do urge the lord mayor to seriously consider this that um if a councillor is working from home for good reasons perhaps because they've just had a kid um they can, they can participate remotely in the committees that they're present on, um, but they don't have that opportunity to sit in on other committees and see what's been discussed in those other meetings. And, and I'm sure the Deputy Mayor would agree with me that 
it, it can be valuable for councillors to sit in on other committees and learn what's being discussed by some of those other portfolios, particularly where it relates to their, um, their local area. So there's, a, there's an accessibility argument there in, in favour of live streaming those committee meetings. And given that now we've got the technology set up for councillors to participate remotely, the cameras are there, the, it's, the infrastructure is essentially available, it would seem to me that it shouldn't be too much of an effort or too much of an additional cost to also just live stream those meetings on, on the public website in the same way as we do for full council meetings. And I know the Lord Mayor thinks that no one's interested in those committee meetings, but actually I, I, I hear from a lot of residents who would like to know what's going on there and would like to be able to watch online. And in fact, some residents are more interested in the committee meetings than they are in the full council meetings. So I, I would encourage the, the Mayor to think about that a bit more deeply. The, just on the, um, the broader restructuring, the other item that we're speaking on at the moment, um, I am also a little bit cynical of any of, the, of these sorts of restructuring moves, but I think really what it comes down to is culture and the values that sit underneath um, an organisation and a change like this. And uh, on the one hand, I think it could be great to have single points of contact where you don't have to call around to lots of different offices and there's only one person you have to talk to. But on the other hand, I worry about those people, um, what were they called, account managers? Yeah. I, I worry about them becoming gatekeepers or um, having too much discretionary power. And that's not really something that can be solved one way or another in terms of the structure. That's about the values and the culture of the organisation. Um, and I want to say very clearly and, and strongly, not just to the councillors in this chamber, but to all of the council officers, that we appreciate the ability as councillors to be able to have frank and direct conversations with you, and particularly with the officers who are subject matter experts in their field. Um, it's often more efficient and um, effective for me to talk directly to an arborist, for example, or to the person who actually knows about playground safety standards, as opposed to be talking to a generalist who ends up serving as a, a, a relay point or a, or a middleman or whatever you want to call it, who doesn't necessarily know the ins and outs of that um, subject matter field. And so through you, Lord Chair, to the Lord Mayor and to, to Councillor Marks, I, I do hope that um, there's that, that the administration will reinforce the value of being able to talk directly to council officers where necessary, um, that those accounts managers won't end up as gatekeepers, um, that they won't exercise too much discretionary power and that councillors will still uh, that the judgment of local councillors will be, still be trusted on those important local issues. Um, there's a lot of give and take between councillors and, and some of those asset services staff. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree, but at least we can have open and direct conversations and the asset services staff do trust the local councillors' judgment about what the general public is willing to accept and what local residents do or don't want. And I think that's one of the um, parts of the role that actually allows us to be effective as local councillors. And I, I, would, I worry a bit, and maybe my worries are unfounded, but certainly I've, I've seen this happen with other parts of council. I worry a bit that the restructure might result in local councillors having less control and input into decisions about their local area. I worry that the restructure might result in less flexibility and innovation where a local councillor comes with a, a novel idea and they can't just talk to their local team anymore about implementing that. It has to go further up a hierarchical chain. And then as a result, those novel and innovative proposals get uh, railroaded. So um, I, I, do, I do hope that that's not the intention of this restructure. And I'm, I'm trying to give the administration the benefit of the doubt, perhaps against my better instincts. Um, I, I don't believe that all the public servants in council are evil, and I don't believe this is some wild conspiracy to cut us out of decision making. Um, but I also do know that there's a general tendency in organisations, particularly, particularly larger organisations, towards unnecessary bureaucratisation, double handling, inefficiencies, etc. Um, and sometimes restructures can help address those problems, and sometimes they can inadvertently create or reinforce such problems. And so um, I really do hope that the administration 
it, it, like I said at the start, it really does come down to the values that sit underneath this restructure. And I think it'll be very, very important um, that the that we don't end up siloing um, teams from conversations with the local council or conversations with each other, that we don't undermine the, um, the local knowledge and insights that local councillors have to offer about what their communities do and don't want, um, and that we don't create a situation where decisions about you know, what, the, what time the toilet block should be locked in a, a random park in Highgate Hill end up getting made by um, a policy maker in, in City Hall who's quite detached from what the community wants on the ground. We still need that ability to support localised decision making and, and flexibility both from our council officers and how they work with local ward, of, ward officers and, and ward staff. So, um, I'm, yeah, I'm giving the, giving the administration the benefit of the doubt here. I'm, I'm hoping and trusting um, that this doesn't all go awry, but if, if it does, I'll, I'll be certainly very critical of that. Um, that change if we do end up with a more hierarchical and less flexible system as a result of this restructure. Further speakers? Councillor Strunk. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Listen, I, I rise to speak on Clause, uh, clause A in regards to the uh, administrative changes. Uh, I attended the briefing and um, uh, I didn't expect to hear what I heard in regards to uh, uh, city standards uh, program uh, and the changes, the massive changes that are going to happen that's going to affect me uh, directly and my, my team and my office uh, quite considerably. Um, having an account, well, first of all, these account managers, um, what an interesting title for them. It uh, doesn't really engender anything other than, and I think uh, Councillor uh, uh, Johnson said, this sort of engenders a, a corporatization, uh, which um, I suppose this is a very big council, uh, you know, $3.1 million budget or billion dollar budget. Um, and, uh, but I, I remember uh, the corporatization that I went through in retail uh, on a couple of occasions, and uh, some of it was beneficial, and then some of it wasn't too beneficial. Um, communications is the issue that we're talking about today, or a lot of the councillors were talking in the debate today. And I worry about the account managers simply because um, they're going to have to be across a lot of different disciplines. Uh, right across asset services to be able to uh, engage with uh, with the ward offices. Now we don't even know how many account managers are going to be for the 26 wards. Is there going to be three or four or two? Or I'm sure there'll be more than two. Uh, but um, they're going to have to deal with a lot of inquiries on a lot across a lot of disciplines. Now currently we are able to deal with um, uh, people within uh, asset services, um, those expertise or those experts. Um, and, um, and there's a number of those people that we deal with now. Um, and sometimes um, communicating to them or getting a response for them because they're very busy in what they do and, and, uh, and we don't think they're just ignoring us when they don't come back to us in, a, in a, what we think is a timely time. Uh, but uh, they're very busy because we're dealing with a lot of other uh, uh, constituents and, uh, and ward offices. And uh, so to actually uh, give it to one individual uh, to um, uh, put the process through to those, expert, those experts and be able to get a response from them. Um, I worry about being filtered. I worry about uh, not intentionally but unintentionally being filtered. I, I, I will ask a question, um, uh, you know, usually from a constituent, uh, and, uh, and they're going to basically, because they're humans, they're going to filter that, that question. Uh, uh, down to the um, down to the expert on the ground, and then can then come back for, with the response. And um, so I, I just worry about that. That's that may sound like it's streamlined, but I think it's actually going to create a back and forth that uh, uh, sort of an unintended consequence here, a back and forth. So uh, I really look forward to hearing um, that these uh, account managers or people that were actually sourced from council already that know what they're doing across a lot of disciplines because they're going to need that expertise to be able to deal with all these, uh, all these questions coming uh, forward. Um, the other issue that I, I, and I didn't get a chance to, to bring it up in the, um, in, the, uh, in, the, um, in the meeting, the briefing I should say, um, there was a lot of acting role, people in acting roles in city standards. Uh, there was a couple in the other programs, um, but uh, there was like four in city standards and I, and I didn't get a chance to say why, why are these people 
uh, still acting because um, they've been acting, it appears, for some time. So may maybe, uh, maybe the Lord Mayor or someone else can answer that question because it does look, uh, it just looked a bit strange actually that there was four, out of the, out of the six, there was actually four that were acting. Um, high profile. Now, in regards to uh, high profile parks, and I'll just finish off with that. Um, thank you, um, uh, Councillor Marks, for uh, uh, letting us le letting me know and the chamber know uh, how um, what high profile parks are and how they come about. Um, and I, and the, the the one one of the conditions uh, for high profile is that uh, people come from across the city to visit that park, probably on a regular basis or semi regular basis. And um, we do have. Um, uh, one park in my area, uh, it's a precinct actually, the Forest Lake Park Precinct, uh, which uh, back in the development days of Delphin, uh, people would come from all over Brisbane to, uh, to look at that park and spend time around, around, the, around the lake as well. And, um, and I would, I would uh, think, uh, I would love to know what the process is to get that uh, elevated to a high profile park. Um, because I think it really deserves it. It, uh, it has uh, fulfilled that role for many, many years. Um, uh, there's a lot of competition out there, of course, I suppose, in other areas and people um, look around and uh, maybe go out to Springfield and other developing areas as well to have a look and spend time in, these, in those uh, other parks. But um, I just think that the park, uh, the Forsyth Park Precinct would, should deserve that sort of categorization. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, further speakers? Further speakers? The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, just briefly, uh, thank you for the councillors who contributed towards that debate. Um, I just did want to say with the um, family-friendly hours and the change, um, uh, it was one of those things where if we had made um, some more wholesale changes, um, there's certain things we can do with start and finishing times of meetings, but more wholesale changes would also need to come through the meetings local law, which, as you know, uh, Mr Chair, is a different process and a more detailed process. We will be uh, bringing through some changes to the meetings local law uh, in, in the future, um, and this is, a, this is a quick step that we could take, um, to, which is a practical one, uh, to help in terms of um, the finishing time of council given what we know about how long meetings go on for average. Uh, so it's a practical thing. Um, I acknowledge some councillors think that we haven't gone far enough with these changes. I would also uh, note that um, the first rule of local government is that for every, e every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And so we make changes in one place, uh, there are impacts in another place. And I, I am very aware um, that while for some backbench or opposition councillors, having council over a two-day period might be a wonderful thing for them. I know that for others it would be um, not so much. Uh, and certainly for the Civic Cabinet, um, look, uh, it is a very busy and involved role, and um, to lose another full day in this way would obviously uh, have an impact on other parts of the, the responsibilities that we have. Now, some councillors, they're only, some councillors, particularly opposition councillors, their only official duty, the only official duty they have is to show up once a week for a couple of committee week meetings um, and a council meeting in the afternoon. That's all they have to do. Um, but for others, uh, particularly in civic cabinet, there's a much more involved role, which is effectively the role of a state government minister. And so um, there are more parts to the role uh, than just council meetings. And even as a local councillor, they know, they know that they have a full job um, out in their ward on a daily basis, uh, meeting with residents, meeting with community groups, planning local upgrades, and so there is much more to the role of being a councillor than uh, one meeting on one day or a couple of meetings on one day. So this is part of the equation and we've done our best to make sure that there's some flexibility here. And the fact that um, Councillor Cook has been able to participate uh, in a hybrid sense shows that we are more than willing to be flexible and to give that flexibility when it comes to the formal council meetings. Um, but these are only one part of the job. Now we, as I um, 
explained, we'll make further changes going forward um, to the meeting's local law. Uh, one of those changes I've flagged before, which is to cut down on the fake urgency motions. The urgency motions which aren't urgent at all and which are a deliberate strategy to make a substantive debate about an issue rather than to debate whether an issue is urgent or not. We saw it again today. And we saw the opposition's deliberate strategy of misleading the public with the, with the claim that every time they move uh, an urgency motion relating to curbside collection, they tell the public that the LNP voted against bringing back curbside collection. That is false. That is false. They are deliberately misusing the rules of this meeting um, to play political games with these issues. The only thing we debate during an urgency motion is whether it is urgent or not, not the substantive matter, not the topic of the motion, um, but rather whether it is considered by the meeting to be an urgent matter or not. So uh, we will most certainly be making changes in that, which give people the opportunity to put more notified motions in place. And so uh, the, uh, at the moment, the cutoff period for notified motions for today's meeting would have been last week. We would like to change that so that in future, the cutoff point for today's meeting would be yesterday at lunchtime. And so that would give people more opportunity to put in well-considered notified motions to actually substantively debate a matter rather than to use or misuse urgency motions to try and do the same thing. That's not the intent of urgency motions, shouldn't be used for that purpose. Uh, and so we'll be making it easier for notified motions to be put on, put on uh, the record uh, with a shorter notice period. Um, that is one of the changes we'll be making. We'll also be happy to consider um, other changes to the meeting's local law as well. Uh, I don't think though that having council sitting um, periods spread out over two days is the right way to go. Um, I, I, I really don't personally think that. Uh, and I think that, as I said, the fact that we have had Councillor Cook participating hybridly, uh, we will no doubt have other councillors using that same system, uh, is um, evidence that we are providing flexibility. Um, and I think the last time that we saw Councillor Cook in here um, on an ongoing basis was last November. Uh, she has popped in once or twice, um, maybe a short time for a council meeting and a couple of times for a protest rally or a Labor Day march. Um, but she has been given all the flexibility she needs to continue doing her role, um, yet she continues to criticise the administration for um, uh, apparently not doing enough to support her or other um, mothers or parents. It is simply not the case. Um, and I'm disappointed that Councillor Cook would take this approach when um, she knows full well that the opposite is true. That the opposite is true. And you, Mr Chairman, sorry to sing you out, but you deserve um, uh, some credit here. Um, you have helped facilitate the changes in this chamber and get the new system working. And I think it is a good system uh, that um, will serve us well into the future. So thank you, Mr Chair, for your role in that. Um, and I'll leave my comments at that. Councillors, in the report item A, all those in favour of item A, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Division. 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 Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Johnson. Please ring the bells. All councillors are present will proceed to a vote. All those in favour of item A, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. And abstentions, please raise your hands. Clarks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 19 in favour, one against and five abstentions. The ayes have it. 
on item I. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnston. Division. Could you please stand? Call division. Division. And Councillor Shree, please ring the bells. All councillors are present will proceed to the vote. All those in favour of item I, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. And, and abstentions, please identify. Please, abstentions, please raise your hand. All right, thank you. Clerks, please read the result uh, when you're ready. <laughs> Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 23 in favour, one against and one abstention. The ayes have it. Councillors, that concludes the Establishment Coordination Committee. We'll now move to the City Planning and Economic Development Committee, please. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 8th of June, 2021, be adopted. Second that. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Hammond, that the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 8th of June, 2021, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, first of the Brisbane Business Hub workshops and mentoring program for this week. Um, uh, just one Councillor this Adams. week. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I have a thousand notes here to remind you. Thank you very much, Mr Chair. Um, I do have to ask if we could take item B, debate and vote, Sari Adam. Item B, Sari Adam for debate and vote. Been trying to remember that all afternoon and still forgot. Um, no sorry. Business Hub. Uh, yes, one program for this week, the external programs, plenty of mentoring going on, but it's 9 till 11 a.m. on the 16th, a panel discussion with three Brisbane-based online retail and service providers, the topic how to become a successful online retail and service provider being presented by Maeve and Bo Kiddo Petite Barcelona. So a lot of variety down there and plenty of workshops continuing. So I say to everybody, please make sure they again sharing the information with their local businesses, businessinbrisbane.com.au. Uh, to the, uh, the committee before us, um, and I will speak about item A and item C. First of all, the committee presentation was on the bill to rent proposal at 60 Sky Ring Terrace and Newstead. And uh, we actually did a lot of the time on the committee about what bill to rent actually is. It's a relatively new concept in Australia, having been successful in the UK and the US. It just means that there is one company which owns and operates the building. No apartments are for sale to residents. However, all residents are completely catered for. So the units are designed for your key worker, essential worker, someone who's looking for affordable rent within the inner city with all amenities provided in the building. So Mervac has partnered with the Queensland Government to deliver this bill to rent proposal, which will see the state government subsidise the rent for the apartments. So some of the key features we looked at was no bond, low energy bills, uh, it's pet friendly, staff are on site to cater to your needs. Uh, it includes arranging dry cleaning, managing food drop-offs, including help for moving in and out when the time comes. Um, there is a reduction in the car parks because they are trying obviously to make the, the accommodation affordable as well. But this this application was um, accompanied by a green travel plan, something that we've asked many other um, applicants to have a look at because it is a very, very good green travel plan, which strongly encourages all occupants of the building to either use public transport, walk, use the e-scooters and e-bikes provided. They also do a certain <coughs> price point, depending on whether you want garaging or not for your cars in this building as well. So the proposal is one of two pilot projects being delivered in Brisbane, with the other proposal being in Fortitude Valley. Uh, petition C before us today is an application that came through at 447 Gregory Terrace in Spring Hill. It got quite a bit of attention as it is the first building to reflect the new um, amendments in city plan from the Spring Hill neighbourhood plan that was adopted in 2018. The site is zoned mixed use and caters for 15 storeys as code accessible as went through the process for the city plan amendment with the neighbourhood plan. The site 
Jones State Heritage listed buildings, so the application was referred to SARA, who only conditioned that vibration and excavation monitoring be put in place to make sure during construction there would be no adverse consequences for the heritage buildings. The main concerns for residents were those that were in the Avalon apartment complex next door, um, mainly around the setbacks. There was a range of setbacks from a minimum of four metres from the building edge up to a maximum of five metres, which is all within code, and of course screening on the windows and conditioning to approval to mitigate any sort of overlooking on this property to other properties as well. It was approved in April this year, and I put item A and C to the chambers. Any further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks, Chair. Can I just ask that item C be taken seriatim for voting, please? Item C seriatim for voting. Yep. Yes, thanks. Uh, this is the development application at 447 Gregory Terrace, Spring Hill, at the bottom, bottom end of Gregory Terrace, not far from the old museum and from uh, right, right next door to some heritage places that are both recognised by Brisbane City Council and the State Government. Uh, and this is a DA uh, and a development that has been strenuously opposed by uh, people people in that community. Uh, it is going to uh, result in uh, an enormous building of enormous bulk on a very tiny site uh, to be abutting a childcare centre on one side uh, and a uh, fairly low-rise um, uh, unit uh, complex that's been there for many, many years that was designed and fits in uh, very well with its surrounding community. Uh, councillor Howard, the local councillor, went out and spoke to residents on site, and this is what they've told me. Uh, and uh, she said to them that she was she was flabbergasted uh, that this development application would be made, uh, and it would would have a, uh, a pretty bad outcome for that community there. And she certainly did not support she did not support this DA going forward, and she would not like to see it approved. And lo and behold, Chair, when an LNP councillor goes out and talks to a community and says, well, we don't support this, we don't support this DA, uh, it's up to someone else, uh, and then lo and behold, Chair, it gets approved. And when this, when this petition comes through council, uh, comes through council, the local councillor supports a recommendation which supports this DA being approved, Chair. Uh, it is a bad outcome. I've been to, I've been to the, uh, the houses, the units that will be uh, right next to this enormous wall of glass. Uh, that will be just mere metres from them, uh, and it is going to uh, have a, a very bad outcome for their personal lives. It's going to be a bad outcome uh, for that part of the neighbourhood, that part of Spring Hill. As I said, it's very close to some very significant uh, uh, buildings of heritage significance, like the old museum and like those heritage listed places and like Victoria Park across the road. Uh, so I, I joined with uh, residents early this year, and uh, we said to them that we wouldn't support we wouldn't support any moves by this LNP administration pushing this DA through. Uh, and they thought they had that commitment from their local councillor, but uh, as we find out today, they never had that after all. Further speakers, Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm also, in regards to item C, quite concerned about that development application and. Um, certainly didn't support it being approved. I think many of the concerns Councillor Cassidy has articulated are correct, and on, on top of that, I don't see any significant public benefit um, that flows from this development. My, I mostly wanted to comment, though, on item, item A, the build to rent um, development, and explain for maybe some of the councillors in the chamber who uh, aren't as across this area of public policy why this kind of build to rent model is not a particularly good one and, and not one that the city should be bending over backwards to, su to support. So um, essentially what these build to rent schemes do is they say, private landlord, you will build and, and deliver the, um, and, and manage the, the rental apartments. And we, the government, will give you uh, a regular subsidy uh, in exchange for you renting out some of those apartments at a lower rent. So. It, Although the uh, LNP kind of likes to pretend that they're all about the free market providing housing, this, this form of affordable housing is heavily dependent on government subsidies. But it's actually a transfer of wealth from the public sector to the private sector. What we actually need in this city is the government to put more money into public housing and to, to subsidise the construction of new public housing and community housing. But what's happening here is that we have private developments that would not be commercially viable and would not stack up and stand on their own two feet 
except that they are receiving a rental subsidy from the government. And I say that because the, uh, the units, the individual units that are rented out as quote unquote affordable accommodation and that attract the subsidy, um, they're generally the lower quality apartments within a building. They're the, the dinky little units at, at ground level or the ones that have really poor views and are overshadowed, et cetera, et cetera. So they're, they're the apartments that are hardest to rent out um, and that you're probably going to have a hard time getting much rent for anyway. They, they still end up being built as part of a project, of course, because you need the, that, that's how the, the, devel the developments are designed. You have the poorly lit, poorly Councilor designed Shrew, apartments. Just, um, well, that's, I, just, that's I called fine. out uh, that's fine. Councillor Marks for something similar. No, that's fine. Um, but, so they, those, those poor, most, most poorly designed uh, units with the least amenity, they're the ones that end up getting rented out through the build to rent, um, through, through the affordable housing subsidy schemes. And it, it is only the flow of the public subsidy from the state government that makes the project viable. If the state government wasn't providing that subsidy, the projects would not be commercially profitable enough for these build to rent operators to deliver them. So there's kind of a false economy going on there where we tell ourselves that the government is providing this subsidy to deliver affordable accommodation, but actually when we approve these sites for this, this kind of high density development, that drives up the land values. It makes it more profitable to develop in these areas, pushes up property, property values, and that in turn makes it harder for governments and non-profit organisations to, to deliver genuine affordable housing in the form of public housing or community org housing. So it's, um, it's not really a good model to be pursuing. Um, it's not a good use of state government funding. They'd be better off putting that money into public housing. Uh, and, and it's not necessarily a good model for this council to be subsidising through, indirectly through exemptions and, and planning code relaxations. Um, there are also some broader critiques of the build to rent model in terms of the lack of agency that in, and negotiating power that individual tenants have, at least when you're negotiating with an individual landlord, um, maybe in some cases the power relationship is a little bit more balanced, but when you're one tenant out of 300 or 400 who all have the same landlord, um, you're kind of a little bit repla replaceable in a way. And, um, and less tenants are willing to organise en masse and engage in rent strikes and other forms of collective action. Tenants who are, participate, who are renting out in these build to rent schemes, they, they don't really have a lot of power or, or agency. And, and we've seen examples of exploitation where uh, student accommodation providers that have a similar business model like SCAPE, um, Unilodge, Etira, et cetera, that they, they are highly exploitative of international students. They charge outrageously high rents, they rip off international students and those international students don't have enough negotiating power to... Point of order, Mr Point of Chair. order, uh, Councillor uh, We do not have privilege in this chambers and Councillor Shree really needs to temper his comments. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, Councillor Shree, that, uh, that uh, we, don't, we don't, do not have uh, privilege in this place and just a reminder that, that uh, councillors are responsible for their own comments. Thank you for your generous reminder, Chair, and I'll, I'll just clarify my comment. I think that the SCAPE um, Corporation is ripping off and exploiting international students and charging unreasonably high rents for poorly designed substandard accommodation. And if they want to sue me for it, bring it on, because um, what they're doing to international students is disgusting. They charge $400 a week for 15 square metre apartments. That's not the bedroom, that's the whole apartment, 15 square metres. They're, they're ex extremely exploitative and they're a, a really good example of why I'm sceptical of the build to rent model. Because you have one big landlord who's also the developer, who's also the property manager, there's no accountability, there are no checks and balances. There are some cities around the world where build to rent schemes can work quite well, but here in Queensland, we have the unique problem of extremely weak renters' rights. Um, so in a policy landscape where renters' rights are very, very weak um, and planning and development quality controls on new builds are also pretty weak, um, you end up with kind of a, a perfect storm of factors leading to the potential of exploitation for low-income renters. So I, I won't labour the point too much, but I, I hope administration councillors in particular aren't deluded into thinking that by supporting this kind of development, you're supporting the provision of genuinely affordable housing for our city. What we need is public housing 
and um, low, low rent community housing, these affordable housing business models, they, uh, often the rent is capped at 75% of market rent, but that's still pretty damn expensive considering how high market rents are. That's not actually affordable for people on low incomes. It's not even affordable for um, middle income earners like uh, early career teachers, nurses, etc. So you, you end up with apartments that are described as affordable, that are partly subsidised by the state government, that receive generous exemptions, et cetera, in terms of the planning code, um, but they're not actually improving affordability and addressing homelessness. And in fact, the approval of such developments drives up property values, drives up land values, and makes it harder to deliver genuinely affordable housing for our communities. So I, I hope that makes sense. And I hope if any councillors have further questions about why this build to rent affordable housing scheme is, is such a crock, please talk to me because the economics are really dodgy. They don't stack up. It's not a good direction for our city to be heading in. Further speakers? No further speakers. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. There is only one gentleman in this place with dodgy economics, and that is the one who just spoke. Um, can I just say, first of all, the building that we have here before us today is a build to rent. It is not aiming to be social housing. It is not aiming to be a, a way out of, for people in homelessness. It is built to rent for key workers. Um, this was a building that was approved several years ago, and I could probably go to the local councillor saying it would have been very expensive to buy an apartment uh, in this site uh, on the building that they had planned to build. Uh, but the uh, application to the state government, once the incentives came through from obviously a state government who find it uh, a good outcome for their essential workers. Um, they came in for a material change of use to make it affordable housing and essential workers. So it's very different to, I think, what um, Councillor uh, Shri was philosophising about. With regards to the Gregory Terrace at Spring Hill, uh, the local councillor did go out and speak to the local community. She did come and make representations uh, to me, but also to the council officers, and there were many changes made based on those um, representations to uh, the application. And you can see those on Development Eye from the original plans to the approved plans. And a lot of people tend to forget that the approved plans are often, very often, extremely different. Um, I just need to call out Councillor Cassidy on the specifics for a man who's been there and talks about the state heritage of the museum. Well, it wasn't about the state heritage of the museum. That was way down the street. It was about the Montessori next door. And SARA, the state heritage body, had no issues with the building as it was being constructed with relation to the heritage site. We are a growing city and we need to see density where there is infrastructure. Spring Hill has infrastructure and it's a about to have the biggest park that's been introduced into Brisbane in more than five decades. I think this is a fantastic opportunity. We hear the bleatings from those in council uh, for Tennyson that it's already a park. No, it's a golf park, and I wouldn't be going and sitting in a golf course having a picnic while the balls were going around as well. All right, councillors, please allow the to council Adams to be heard in silence. But the neighbourhood plan Councillors. I'll take Councillor Cassidy's interjection that there's no golf on Gregory Terrace. Maybe he hasn't been there if he didn't see how close this is actually to the Victoria Park redevelopment that is starting in just the next couple of months. The Spring Hill Neighbourhood Plan, adopted only two and a half years ago, sees exactly this type of development in this pocket, close to the CBD, close to infrastructure and close to green open space. Can I assure you it is far less dense than when we're seeing EDQ cramming into Bowen Hills, but we will pick up the slack by delivering Victoria Park over the next 10 to 15 years, and I recommend both these to the Chamber. Uh, councillors, in relation to item A, all those in favour of item A, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, with item C, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. no. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cumming. Please ring the bells.
Councillors, we'll proceed to the vote on item C. All those in favour of item C, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. Aye. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 17 in favour and six against. The ayes have it. Councillor Adams, item B, please. Thank, Thank you, point of Mr order. Chair. Point of order. Uh, point of order, uh, Councillor Johnston. Yes, I move that the motion be taken off the table. Seconded. What, what, what motion? The motion that's on the table. I don't, wh uh, which, which motion is that? Need, you need to be clearer. That would be the motion that I moved, calling on uh, boarding houses to be uh, removed from the city plan, which Councillor Adams has been blocking for the past eight months, which is on the table, and I have just moved that it be re-entered into debate, um, as is my right to do, Mr Chairman. So could you please do your job and put no, it to the vote? There's no need for cheap shots, Councillor Johnston. No, 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 no. There was no need for that. You provided... No, 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 don't talk. That you provided no detail, you and you, you demanded you demanded something happen without any context or detail, and then you blame other people for not understanding what you want. It's not acceptable. All right. So uh, now there is a uh, there is a uh, procedural resolution to take this matter off the table. All those who wish to take it off the table, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. no. The noes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor yeah, Johnson, Councillor Griffiths. Please ring the bells. Councillors, all those in favour of removing the item off the table, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hands. Aye. Clerks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the venue being six in favour and 17 against. The noes have it. Councillor Adams, item B, please. Um, thank you. Just before item B, with regards to the motion that was just mentioned, I made it very clear that we were happy to debate that motion and take it up the table. Off the table once the housing strategy was complete, which is still in process. Uh, with response to clause B, Mr Chair, I need to declare a declarable conflict of interest. As I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland, the Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of $16,500 in April 2016. Point of order, Point of order Councillor Landers. Um, I declare a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of 16500 in April 2016. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Mackay. I declare a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I'm a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of 16500 in April 2016. Point of order, Mr Point Chair. Point of order, Councillor Maddock. I declare a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of $16,500 in April 2016. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Adaman. Um, I declare a declarable conflict of, of interest in Clause B. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. Uh, the Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland $16,500 in April 2016. 
Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Hammond. I declare, um, I declare a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I'm a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of 16500 in April 2016. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Atwood. I declare a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of 16500 in April 2016. Uh, point of order, point order, of order Mr. Councillor Chair. Wong. I declare a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of 16500 in April 2016. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor McLaughlin. I have a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of $16,500 in April 2016. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Davis. I declare a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I'm a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of $16,500 in April 2016. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Murphy. I have a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I'm a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of $16,500 in April 2016. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Allen. I declare a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I'm a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of $16,500 in April 2016. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Marks. I declare a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of 16500 in April 2016. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Howard. I declare a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of 16500 in April 2016. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Toomey. I also have a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I'm a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of 16500 in April 2016. I too uh, declare a declarable conflict of interest in Clause B. I'm a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The Village Retirement Group made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland of $16,500 in April 2016. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Yes, I don't take money from developers. I that's don't no, have a conflict go, of interest. No, that's not a point of order. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, I don't have a declarable conflict of interest, and neither do any of the LNP councillors that have just stood up. The advice from City Legal Office is very clear that the state government laws around declarable conflicts of interest take into account if the donations are made to the political party. Uh, each election, uh, which includes state elections and each candidate, so there's 213 candidates to be divided amongst that $16,500. So, which is $77. Yeah. So this, this matter can absolutely um, be you, decided Councilor and debated Cassidy. by this council as chamber, you, and you well should get know, some legal advice. As you well know, I take the... Um, I always take... No, 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 there's no need for a floor debate about this. We, we um, always take the more conservative view on this matter. Um, point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Shree. Sorry, um, I'm not trying to be difficult, but I just wanted to understand, is Village Retirement Group a developer? I'm, I'm not sure. They are? Uh, aren't, aren't developer donations banned? Okay, no, 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 we're not having, this is not a, this is not a general chitter chatter, right? Can I please have a resolution to defer this to the CEO? Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that this chamber resolve that as a majority of councillors present have a declared conflict of interest in this matter, deciding this matter by, be delegated to the Chief Executive Officer in accordance with Section 238 of the City of Brisbane Act 2010. Second that. There is a resolution to uh, refer this matter to the CEO in line with the provisions of the Act. Uh, Councillor Adams, do you have any comment? Any debate? Councillor Johnston. Yes, I do. Um, I just heard an interjection from Councillor Hammond, and I'm not sure whether it, I heard it right, um, that this was a donation from five years ago in 2016. No, Councillor Johnston, that was your interjection. No. Um, that's what you said. Um, but. 
But look, please uh, just, just stick to the topic at hand. Should it be yeah, referred to the CEO, CEO I, or not? <coughs> so I heard an interjection from Councillor Hammond indicating that this was an historic donation from 2016. Um, now, and, and Councillor Adams is nodding her head, so uh, that must be right. So that's five years ago. Now, my understanding is um, that uh, from the briefings we've had, uh, that historic donations like this um, are not considered to be a conflict of interest, number one. Um, number two, I think it is right to describe the um, village as a developer. They also run retirement villages. There is one in my ward. Um, but they are very big property developers and they have very close ties to the Liberal National Party. Uh, so uh, certainly that's okay, but if it was happening last year or the year before, that would be relevant. Um, in my view, this is a way of stopping this matter from being decided and discussed here, and that is what is inappropriate about what's happening at the moment. Mr Chair, uh, I agree with... Uh uh, Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Johnson. Uh, Councillor Cassidy has uh, quoted the evidence, the uh, advice he's received. He's done the sums, and it and it doesn't uh, comply. It's, it's not a, a matter where uh, uh, all of the LNP councillors need to declare a conflict of interest and and the matter being sent off to the CEO. He's produced his uh, evidence and uh, given the details of it. Uh, where where's the uh, contrary advice from the uh, from the uh, administration? It's not there. So and. Uh, I wanted to speak on this matter because you know my my clients are the ones who've been ripped off and had uh, and they've got a development going ahead with 20 26 percent of the uh, 26 percent of the trees on so when when a matter is when a matter is is has a, has a potential conflict no 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 point of order point of order chair point of order councillor Murphy councillor point of order councillor hey, point of order no councillor Cumming. Councillor Cumming, I consider you're displaying unsuitable meeting conduct and in accordance with section 21.5 of the Meetings Local Law 2001, I hereby, you, uh, hereby request that you cease yelling and speaking over other councillors and recognise when your uh, microphone has been turned off and allow others to speak and refrain from exhibiting that conduct in the future. Point of order to Councillor Murphy. Chair, I was just making the point that it is incumbent on each individual councillor to decide whether they have a conflict of interest when it comes to a matter that Thank comes you. before the council. It's not up yep. uh, for Thank them you. to d decide whether we do or don't. Thank you. And, and also, Matt, discussing... No. Discussing the substance is a potential breach, and that's why I, have, that's why I must insist on pulling up uh, Councillor Cumming while he was discussing that matter. Are there any, are, is there any further debate on the resolution? Uh, councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I just rise to speak on the resolution. I, I actually agree that the LNP councillors should be disclosing um, this donation because the fact that the LNP accepted a donation of $16,500 for a developer just after the 2016 council election, that, that is a conflict of interest and that should definitely be declared, but I think it highlights a broader problem in the way our political system works, which is that um, political parties have taken money from big corporations and that compromises their ability to make decisions that are in the best interests of the city as a whole. And um, I think it's good that property developers are now banned from donating to political parties, but um, part of the problem is that uh, developers and other corporate ent entities make donations to political parties as a way of buying access to a club. It's kind of like paying your entry ticket at the door. And once you've paid that donation, you get closer access to key decision makers within the party hierarchies. You get the ability to influence party policy. Um, it's not direct bribery necessarily. I, I don't actually believe that developers and other companies make direct donations to parties and say, hey, here's $16,000, please approve my new retirement village. What actually happens is that those donations are about buying allegiance and buying access to an, an elite networked club um, that scratches each other's backs and, and um, makes favourable decisions for one another over time. And that's why it is important that these donations are declared. And, and I do think it's good that it's a legal requirement now for these donations to be declared and these conflicts of interest to be declared. Um, but it highlights a broader problem, which is just that the LNP is still receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations from other companies and corporate entities. And um, and those, do, those donations are not disclosed as, as pu publicly as conflicts of interest. And that, that, I think, undermines deeper faith in the political system. So it's 
it would be it's great that these donations are being disclosed, but um, I think both the Labor Liberal parties, even the Greens, everyone should be required legally to disclose conflicts of interest in the form of other donations that have been received from businesses um, that might influence decision making in this place. And um, I think that's a shame and I think it's something that could be improved upon and hopefully down the track um, we'll get to the point where all corporate donations from companies to political parties are banned um, and we can have a system of publicly funded elections that doesn't depend on this kind of um, what I would describe as dodgy, dodgy dealings. Further speakers? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. The declarable period for a conflict of interest is the elections in 2016. Um, the donations were made to the council team. We have declared our correct declarable conflict of interest. I asked Councillor Shree, how is that transferable? How is that transparent on the $271,000 here that was donated under the Australian Greens? Wonder where they got that money from. We will now put the resolution to uh, refer this matter to the CEO. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We will now proceed to public and active transport. That concludes city planning. Councillor Murphy. Chair, I move that the report of the public and active transport committee meeting held on Tuesday the 8th of June 2021 be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Landers, that the report of the public and active transport committee dated. Tuesday, the 8th of June, 2021, be adopted. Is there any debate? Uh, Councillor Murphy. Uh, thank you. Uh, last week, the Public and Active Transport Committee heard from officers on the success story that is now the Indrapilly River Walk. It was opened a few days earlier on Sunday the 6th by the Lord Mayor and Councillor Mackay, and it was wonderful to see so many people attended down at Indrapilly to take part in activities, including a free sausage sizzle, fairy floss, face painting, uh, and to try the new river walk. And I understand there were hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands of people, Councillor Mackay, just waiting to get on that amazing uh, new structure. So it's very clear that the project means a lot to locals in the western suburbs. And uh, well done to Councillor Mackay on what uh, was a very worthy celebration of that incredible project in the community. The other thing, uh, uh, Chair, when it comes to terrific outcomes is that the Indrapilly River Walk was completed ahead of time and under budget. Um, this new connection is a critical part of active transport links in the western suburbs and will let people move uh, safely uh, between the Western Freeway and the University of Queensland. Anyone who knows the area will know that existing roads and paths uh, were very narrow and there was no dedicated cycling facilities except for a few markings uh, with bicycles on them going down Radnor Street. Um, the new route along the Brisbane River links Twig Street and the Jack Pesh Bridge spanning 790 metres of now a uh, fantastically wide, five metre wide pedestrian and two-way separated cyclist facility. With 1,400 cyclists and 540 pedestrians using the Jack Pesh Bridge each day, we need to make sure that they have safe infrastructure to be able to continue their trip. While the river walks a very important piece of critical infrastructure, we know that having safe and easy connections from local streets is also really critical. The project also delivered a cyclist and pedestrian connection on, uh, to Foxton Street from the Riverwalk and an upgrade of the Foxton Street and Radnor Street intersection to create a safer environment for all road users. In addition, there's a dedicated pedestrian connection to Riverview Terrace and a connection to the Jack Pesh Bridge and the Indrapilly Railway Station by linking the Riverwalk to the existing path at Witten Barracks. For those interested in the uh, logistical and engineering work that goes into construction, I can tell you that um, the majority of works uh, for the project were constructed from a river barge and a temporary jetty. 84 piles were bored with an average length of 20 metres into the river. Uh, 184 precast concrete beams were installed between 14 and 18 metres in length. Nearly 6,000 cubic metres of concrete was poured with 790 tonnes of steel reinforcement alone. The Interpilly River Walk is also a fantastic example of projects by the Shrina Council benefiting the local economy around Brisbane and across the region with 60 local jobs created and a range of different suppliers used. And um, we had pile liners sourced from Wacol, precast bridge decks manufactured in Bromelton, fabricated steelworks sourced from Toowoomba and Brendale, stormwater pipes manufactured at Eagle Farm, quarry materials supplied from Sheldon, premixed concrete batched in 17 mile rocks, piling completed by a contractor based in Clontarf. We had uh, electrical works completed by a supplier based in Yatla. 
Uh, block work was completed by a contractor based in Wool and Gabba. Paintings and coatings by contractors based in Carroll Park and Kelvin Grove. And concreting was done by a contractor based a little bit further out in Canungra. Uh, once again, the Shrina Council is delivering vital active transport links to get people out of our cars and enjoying our city by foot, bike and scooter. Uh, thanks, Cheryl. I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? For Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on item A, and uh, as usual, I'll be brief because I know my colleague, Councillor Cumming, likes it that way. Um, now, look, unfortunately for me, Councillor Murphy has stolen a bit of my thunder with a few of the stats, but I know there's a, a large cohort of people watching online desperate to see my speech and read it in the minutes in the years to come, so I am going to go over a few of those stats, so thank you for your indulgence. And I was speaking to my, my good friend and colleague, uh, Councillor Maddock, earlier, Chair, and he told me that the idea for Riverwalk started all the way back in 2012, when, um, as Public and Active Transport Chair, Councillor Maddock sat down with then Councillor Simmons and went through some of the requirements for bikeways and connections in the western suburbs. And during his pap uh, Public and Active Transport Chairmanship, between 2012 and 2016, Councillor Maddock put the foundations down for what is now the Indrapilly Riverwalk. Indrapilly Riverwalk. So it became a, uh, an election commitment in 2016, and look where we are now. So what do we see now? Well, 790 metre long, five metre wide, world-class cycling asset. We've got viewing platforms, which are great at sunset, they look beautiful at night. We have a new pedestrian crossing on Radnor Street to enhance pedestrian safety so it's easier and safer to continue your active travel journey. We've got heritage protection. The original ferry crossing point was protected and there's now a, uh, a sign indicating where that point was. The Indrapilly Canoe Club is getting a new shed and future upgrades and of course I know all of my colleagues are still holding their breath, but you can relax. There are no stairs on this bikeway. Oh, so how was it built? Well, consulta consultation started in 2018 and construction started on the 6th of April in 2020. And it was done from a barge because access to the site is quite difficult on the side of the cliff in the river. And what was involved? Well, as you may have heard, 84 holes were bored for pilings. There were precast beams, a concrete deck, retaining walls, lighting signage and balustrading. And all of that occurred in uh, 2021. And this included 230,000 work hours from 60 local workers. This was made for locals by locals. The local supply included bridge decks from Bromelton, pile liners from Wacol, handrails from Toowoomba, piling from Clontarf and some electrical work from Logan Lee. We had a fantastic opening with upwards of 2,000 people. There was coincidentally, just as the Lord, where Lord Mayor went to open the bridge, uh, Riverwalk Bridge, the, uh, there was a low-flying aircraft. So we even got a free flyover um, to signify the opening of the Riverwalk, which is fantastic. So where to from here? Well, we are going to continue our advocacy to the state government for the Witten Road extension from Twig Street to the freeway. So the South East Queensland economic stimulus funding from the state will be critical for this and we wait with bated breath to see whether or not the state government comes through with that funding. So I need to give thanks to Councillor Maddock for getting the ball rolling, other uh, public and active chairs, travel chairs for allowing it to continue and for following it through to Julian Simmons for when he was councillor for pushing for this project, the Lord Mayor for his support, and I'm very pleased to say that even though it opened 20 minutes late last Saturday, it opened six months early and $4 million under budget. Yeah. Further speakers, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Chair. <clears throat> I rise to speak briefly on Riverwalk, <clears throat> and I wasn't going to speak, but... Um, I, I find it uh, delusional that the councillor for Walter Taylor thinks there's no stairs in this, uh, in this project. There's a giant new staircase built underneath uh, the northern pylon uh, running down to uh, the... Point of order, uh, Point of order uh, Councillor Mackay. Claim to be misrepresented. Mm -hmm. 
pretty clearly on the record saying there's no stairs in this bikeway project. Well, yes, there are. There's a big giant new staircase running down from the northern pylon of the Walter Taylor Bridge uh, down to the uh, walkway, uh, which is now uh, Riverwalk. Um, so, firstly, um, the connection uh, from the southern side of the river, which has been my concern, um, has... Uh, I mean, we've still got the option of going around via Radnor Street, but the big problem there, and Councillor Murphy is in the chamber, is there's a giant dumpster located in the pathway um, outside the northern pylon of the Walter Taylor Bridge. It just sits there. So you can't get round it. It's just a huge dumpster. I don't know why it's been there. It's been there for years. Council won't move it, we've asked. Um, but the bikeway from the Walter Taylor Bridge, you have to go round the giant dumpster, which is stored in the pathway. And then you can choose to go down the giant new staircase that Councillor uh, for Walter Taylor doesn't seem to know about. Um, so he can't have had much of a look around. Or you can choose to go around uh, the road uh, and join on at the new entrance at uh, Foxton Street and Radnor Street and connect up there. So I've spoken with the bug uh, about how it all went. I know I didn't get a personal invitation, but that's, that's quite fine. I had my Pilates class and I was much happier to be there. Uh, because um, I did want to find out what people thought, and uh, the bug had some interesting feedback. Uh, firstly, um, apparently someone forgot to open the end where the politicians weren't. Uh, so as long as you were at the Whitnami barracks, you were fine, apparently, um, where the, all the LMP had their tents up. Uh, and another resident who popped over and had a bit of a look at me said, Nicole, was that an LMP party function? And I said, no, no, I'm pretty sure that was the opening of the... Uh, the, the river walk. Um, so if you weren't at the LNP function at the Whitnami Barracks, you were forgotten if you were starting from the fig tree pocket end. And the bug said to me they had um, uh, dozens of children waiting there to ride on the bikeway and <laughs> Councillor Murphy and the Lord Mayor forgot to open uh, the, uh, the fig tree pocket end. So um, apparently you had to be funnelled through the LNP gauntlet before uh, you could get onto the river walk at the official launch. Um, and given you're not supposed to have party signage in parks, I was very surprised to see all that Liberal Party signage um, uh, that was there in the tents. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Mackay. Claim to be misrepresented. Noted. Councillor Johnston. Uh, goodness me. I mean, I uh, didn't actually mention Councillor Mackay. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the LNP signage in the parks. Now, you know, there are a few other LNP councillors that scraped over the line um, uh, with the councillor for Walter Taylor. I mean, he did just scrape over the line. Um, and his, his predecessor, who helped him uh, just scrape over the line, was there. And I understand it was his tents that were up. So um, I'm certainly talking about the LNP, who had their giant signage and tents up in the Whitnami barracks. And it was noted by a lot of people that it appeared to be a Liberal Party event not a community event run by council. That also is disappointing. So I just say to Councillor Murphy, move the giant dumpster out of the bikeway so people who use the uh, Walter Taylor Bridge can access the staircase or the Radnor Street pathway and use the part of Riverwalk um, that is available to them. That would be quite helpful. Councillor Mackay, you have two uh, matters of misrepresentation. Thanks, Chair. First of all, I quite clearly said no stairs on the bike way. And my second point is uh, with regards to LNP signage. I believe it's a crime to have uh, political signage in a park, and there was absolutely zero political signage in the park. And I'm not sure <laughs> if I'm being defamed by saying I'm committing a crime. Th thank you, Councillor Mackay. All right, uh, further speakers. Any further speakers, Councillor Murphy? I now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Infrastructure Committee report, please. Not yet.
Um, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 8th of June 2021 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor McLaughlin, seconded by Councillor Maddock. The report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 8th of June 2021 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor McLaughlin. Uh, just briefly, Mr point Chair. Of order. Uh, sorry. Point of order. Sorry. sorry, I just asked that items C and D be dealt with seriatim for voting purposes. Okay. Thank you. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, this was the last committee, present, a committee presentation for the season um, and we finished up uh, on a strong note looking at the work that council undertakes, council officers undertake to make sure that all the major projects across the city are coordinated in terms of the impacts that they may have on our city and, the, on, and on the network, both vehicle movements and pedestrian movements. So, uh, this, so this is... Uh, uh, something that we've presented previously and we've provided updates uh, on a couple of occasions now about the impacts that these projects are having, drawing attention to the closure of the Riverside Expressway this weekend. Um, and uh, again, a reminder to those who might, might need to move through the city this weekend that the Riverside Expressway will be closed for the construction of uh, the bridge across the, uh, the Riverside Expressway um, for the uh, benefit of uh, building a Walking Bridge, which will be a great outcome when it's done, but uh, this weekend means uh, that Riverside Expressway will be closed and we again ask uh, residents to look at alter their alternative travel movements. Uh, there were three petitions uh, uh, and um, Councillor Cumming wants to vote on those separately. I'll uh, leave debate at this stage to others. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Cumming. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Mr Chairman, uh, in relation to item C and D, there are two sides of the uh, of the one argument. Uh, one petition requests the retention of car parking spaces while the other one uh, seeks the removal of car parking spaces. Uh, it's not a simple issue. There's a shopping centre in Wynnum at uh, uh, 89 Bay Terrace, which extends along Bay Terrace, one of the main streets in the old part of Wynnum, from Florence Street to Edith Street. It's probably about 30 or 40 years old. Its official name is the Wynnum Shopping Centre. It's been redeveloped on several occasions. Uh, some time ago it changed hands and the new owners sought to have the loading zones. There's four, as I said, four spaces in, in, uh, in Bay Terrace uh, outside the shopping centre. The two loading zone spaces were uh, removed to allow uh, more footpath dining along that section of Bay Terrace. Uh, there's a new uh, bar established called the Fat Duck Bar, which is uh, one of the several new bars in Wynnum Central. It's, uh, Wynnum's are going ahead in leaps and bounds in recent years. And, uh, but now the owners have come back and said they want the uh, two car parking spaces, the other car parking spaces along uh, that section of Bay Terrace outside the shopping centre removed as well. Now, I don't agree with that. Uh, there's uh, several uh, food businesses along that part of the, uh, of the terrace which are uh, re heavily reliant on those car parking spaces to allow uh, customers easy access. And I'm convinced, as are a lot of other people, that uh, if we remove those car parking spaces, then uh, that would mean a, uh, a situation where the, the, the businesses of those two uh, businesses, Pierre's Chickens and Mary's Kebab Zone, would be damaged. And uh, I'm not keen to see that uh, happen. They've already got some uh, footpath dining, a fair bit of footpath dining in that area. It's not utilised to any great extent. And I don't believe that... Uh, removing two car parking spaces would uh, make much difference and certainly wouldn't be of any, any benefit to these uh, businesses. The, uh, so I support the recommendation of council staff in relation to each of these petitions. Further speakers? There being no further speakers, Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. Well, Councillor Cumming, just to find the, what we all see every day in this business, uh, and as the Lord Minister said earlier, for a reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. One petition for the removal of uh, car parking spaces, one petition uh, asking them to be retained. Councillor Cumming has uh, got what he asked for in response to both petitions. Uh, go hard, Councillor Cumming, and sell it. Off you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, in, in regards to item A and B, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Uh, in regards to item C and D, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The division. ayes have it. And a division, division called by Councillor Cumming, Councillor Griffiths. Please ring the bells.
councillors, we will proceed to a vote. All those in favour of item C and D, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The vote being 21 in favour. The ayes have it. That, that concludes the Infrastructure Committee. Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, please. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday, 8 June 2021 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Davis, seconded by Councillor Mackay. The report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 8th of June 2021, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Davis. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. Our committee presentation was an update on Brisbane's Koala Research Partnership Program. Brisbane is home to a large koala population, but we know that they do face some threats. In 2018, this administration initiated a program to protect <coughs> koalas in Brisbane that would build on existing initiatives such as the koala detection dogs. The Shrina Council is investing $1.1 million in research partnerships across four projects. A partnership with the Federation University of Australia is seeing the development of new technology to compare koala DNA samples to look at changes in genetic diversity. A partnership with the University of Sunshine Coast is using DNA samples from koala detection dog surveys to analyse disease susceptibility and how genetic diversity can improve health. Our UQ partnership involves on-ground research to assess the health of our koalas and address concerns on the spot. An outcome of this project is that disease in the Belmont Hills Bushland Reserve has gone from approximately 75 per cent of the population being affected to less than 10 per cent, which is a fantastic outcome. UQ is also developing a capsule probiotic for koalas treated for chlamydia, which, if successful, will improve the success rate for rehabilitating koalas. Mr Chair, the Shrina Council is working to make Brisbane the koala capital of Australia, and it was wonderful to receive an update on the research being undertaken thanks to the investment of this administration. Um, Mr Chair, there are also three petitions. I'll speak to one petition as a local councillor regarding establishing a community garden in Augusta Street, Aspley. The response clarifies that rezoning the land is not required. However, there are a number of other factors to consider, including community consultation. As local councillor, I will continue to discuss this matter with interested local residents. And I'll leave debate on the other items to the Chamber. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Anyone? Uh, Councillor Griffiths, yeah, we'll someone, take an... <laughs> if someone had to do it, else we're moving on. Councillor Griffiths. We're just sharing terms, that's all. But thank you, Mr Chair. I just um, wanted to say that it was a very interesting presentation with regards to koala research. And um, it's interesting to hear how, um, how that research is being shared. And it's good to know that that information has been shared, not just uh, across the universities, but also with, uh, with the state government as well. So that's... Uh, interesting, sensible partnership. Um, I would just add that I hope we can extend our research pro programs with Griffith University too. It's one of our key universities in the city, um, has a, a world famous eco centre there, has a very healthy uh, koala population and um, has many very bright and um, uh, uh, bright students uh, that we could tap into for uh, the research that we ne need to do now and into the future. <laughs> uh, I believe as a city, while this is, um, this is set a benchmark, um, we could be doing so much more in terms of leading uh, as the largest, um, largest capital city in Australia, leading on the urban forests, leading on koala management, and uh, certainly leading internationally on, on this piece of work as well. Anyway, um, that's all I've said. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on item D about the National Defence Chaplains Memorial at uh, Anzac Park in Tawong. This is actually very well progressed. It's the second time <coughs> a petition like this has come through. Excuse me. <coughs> and um, I'm very happy to uh, acknowledge the great works of Mr. Peter Collins, CGMM, convener of the Cannon Garland Memorial, because Cannon Garland held the first Anzac Day service just near this place. And it is a very big deal for us to be getting a national memorial. I understand the uh, Defence Minister is right behind this. And uh, most 
as you would know, Chair, most national memorials are in Canberra. But we are progressing this, <clears throat> like we have the Nurses' Grove of Len Lemon Myrtle, the Avenue of Honour with Illawarra, <clears throat> excuse me, Illawarra flame trees, and the Cannon Garland Memorial of the Lone Pine Tree from the descendant from Gallipoli. So Anzac Park is a very special place, and we met on site with Mr. Collins, the ADF Ex Services Organisation delegation, including um, Chaplain Lavaki from One Div. Senior Chaplain David Horn from 11 Brigade, David Ashton, the President of the Naval Association, Commander Darrell Neal, the Treasurer of the Naval Association and Committee of Anzac Day Commemoration Queensland, and uh, Urban Forest Protection Restoration Team uh, from News in Council, and some others, and it's all happening. And I'll just be very quick. The design rationale for this is a Maltese cross motif representing the St Edward's Crown, and it's also the insignia of the chaplains in Australian Army. And with, uh, the elements might include trees planted in the corners of the Maltese cross, in, uh, and four trees that encircle a golden flowering tree at the very heart, representing the desert's flora, so familiar to generations of Australian service personnel. The outer points might be golden wattle to in Tice visitors to feel embraced on all sides by the spreading protective arms of those whose faith is unshakable. There's a little bit more that Mr Collins wrote for me, but in the interest of time, I'll just say thank you to him and his cohort for pulling this together, and I'm thrilled that Council is progressing it. Further speakers? Yes. Councillor Cumming. Yes, uh, Mr Chair, in relation to item C, I support the response to the petition. Uh, the petition refers to Winner Manley's old skate park at Loder. Uh, the, this skate park was suffering from cracking when uh, Winner Manley's new park was built due to my saving of three years' worth of SIF funding. Council staff actually recommended that the Loder facility be demolished. I said no, it was still usable. And now the federal government has supplied considerable funding to upgrade the Loder skate park. So I look forward to seeing the design of the renovated park. And uh, when that's been completed, Winner Manley will have two skate parks, one in the north at Primrose Park, the new one that was built just a couple of years ago, and one in the south at Loder. So I s support the proposed response to the petition. Thank you. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor Davis. I now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee, please. Councillor Marks. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 8th of June 2021, be adopted. Seconded, Chair. It's been moved by Councillor Marks, seconded by Councillor Toomey. That the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 8th of June 2021, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Marks. Thank you, Mr Chair. Just before I head to the report, I do want to pass on um, my condolences to Duncan Pegg's family. Many of you will know by now, I would suggest, um, the passing of um, what I would suggest is a, my local state member, Duncan Pegg, who was a member for Stretton. Um, I'd like to consider him also a friend. We spent um, many, many um, days and evenings together um, in functions, at different functions across our um, very multicultural community. Um, he always used to joke that um, he would sit next to me at dinner so that he could finish off whatever I didn't eat. So it was um, always good because I didn't like to waste food. So he was always more than happy to finish off my dinner for me. So um, I know, um, the other thing was I wanted to have the opportunity to say that I, um, I had the opportunity to talk to him um, a few days before he passed. Um, so I was able to say my goodbyes, which I, I was um, very pleased with, um, and that um, he thanked me for um, the, the years of work that we had worked together in um, such a collaborative manner for our residents. So I'll always um, be appreciative of that. So I know he will be um, sorely missed by the community. Um, moving on to the committee presentation, um, we did a presentation on the Argo all-terrain vehicles. Um, it's just another way that this Shrina Council is providing everything that the um, mosquito entomologist teams need to do their job. Um, it was a shame we couldn't actually have a presentation of the actual vehicle, but Lord Moyer um, and myself actually have been out on site and had a little bit of a ride in one of them, and they are pretty amazing machinery, and the, the plan is that we will be rolling them out across the whole um, area by September. All the vehicles will be all-terrain Argos. Um, and there was a petition, which I'm happy to leave for the debate to the Chamber. Thank you. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor Marks. We now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. 
Uh, the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, please. Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Chair. I move that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 8th of June 2021 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Landers, that, reported that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 8th of June 2021 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor uh, Howard. Thank you, Chair. Before I address the committee report, I'd just like to respond to a question on notice from last week's committee, and I can advise that council records show that 633 children attended the 2019 Homeless Connect event and 660 children attended the 2021 Homeless Connect event. I was asked for those statistics. Um, the presentation last week was on Homeless Connect, and I think everyone in this chamber um, acknowledges the good work that that particular event um, is for um, our community. The committee was shown a list of the broad range of participating service providers as well as testimonials and good news stories from guests and providers and really like to, have, to thank some of the event supporters of Homeless Connect, Volunteer in Queensland, the Salvation Army, Rapid Relief Team, Food Bank and Council's libraries and ward offices. Um, and uh, can I just uh, finish by once again thanking all of our um, officers for the fantastic work that they do and particularly um, to support uh, events such as this. Thank you. Further speakers? Anyone? Councillor Howard? I now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. The Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee, please. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 8th of June 2021 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Huang, that the report of the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 8th of June 2021 be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Allen? Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. In last week's uh, committee meeting, we had a presentation on the uh, corporate security incident management. Um, council's processes require that all incidents be reported regardless of severity and not surprisingly uh, most of the uh, incidents that are reported uh, tend to be sort of high frequency but low impact and the uh, range of incidents that might be recorded include uh, vandalism, uh, attempted break and entering, graffiti and the like. Um, there's an established process for reporting incidents. Council officers are encouraged to report all incidents, no matter how minor, and then based on the nature of the incident, there um, will be an investigation and ultimately uh, some kind of report. And in some instances, uh, particularly uh, severe incidents are actually reported to the Queensland Police Service. Um, we do have instances where we have losses and during the uh, period from the 1st of November 2020 to the 30th of April 2021, we had nine incidents where there was a reportable loss. Um, the corporate uh, security team continue to uh, look at ways of improving uh, what they're doing and so there are a range of um, activities taking place at the moment to enhance our uh, corporate security processes. Um, I won't go into a lot more detail on the present, uh, presentation but it was uh, uh, very insightful. In addition to the presentation we had a regular committee report, the Bank and Investment Report for April 2021 and I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? <coughs> Any further speakers? Councillor Allen? I will now put the report. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. That concludes the consideration of committee reports. Councillors, are there any petitions? Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. I have two petitions. One uh, requesting the introduction of traffic calming measures on Newstead Avenue in Newstead. The other is a petition requesting Council implement traffic calming in Melrose Lane in Kalinga. Councillor Marks. Thank you, Mr Chair. I have a petition regarding uh, requesting Council reinstate Kirkside collection. Any others? May I please have a resolution to receive them? Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Lander, second by Councillor Strunk, that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Council, it's general business. Are there any statements required as a result of an Office of the Independent Assessor or Councillor Ethics Committee order? Are there any matters of ordinary general business? Councillor Adams. 
Thank you, Mr Chair, and I just would like to stand to take this opportunity in the last council meeting before she finishes to wish the very best to my outgoing divisional manager in CPAS, Andrea Canafake. Um, I have had the great pleasure of working with uh, Andrea since I started here in council. She has been in the city planning, if not the CPAS, um, over that time when I first started with her and then into divisional manager in CPAS uh, in 2012. She has done an absolutely outstanding job in the nine years that she has been in her role. I'm sure anyone on the executive management team would, uh, would agree that she is a major contributor to making sure that the council runs smoothly, but not only that, that we deliver through the city planning and also through the news branches what we need to for the people of Brisbane. She has the great ability to be able to retire at a young age so she can go and enjoy it with her family. I'm extremely jealous, but I would just like to say on behalf of the Shrinna Council, thank you for your many, many years of service. You will be so missed. I will miss our weekly catch-ups about council and everything else as well, and I hope she truly enjoys her retirement with her husband. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Howard. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I have to just correct something that I said in my report where I reported on the council records of the children attending the Homes Connect. Those, those stats were for all attendees, so I will get the um, information that was requested about children um, to the committee members. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just uh, rise to speak tonight uh, on one uh, event that actually happened on on Sunday. Um, since 2008, um, there uh, we've held in my uh, in my area where I where I live um, a uh, Queensland Day Award. Now these were uh, kicked off uh, by. Um, uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk, the member for Anala, and uh, Milton Dick, who was the councillor for uh, Richland's ward for many years. Um, they, um, the awards, uh, unfortunately, weren't able to go ahead last year, of course, because of COVID-19, uh, but uh, they were back uh, uh, better than ever uh, this year. And uh, we have, uh, we, um, there was a, a number of local he heroes that were um, um, recognised, and I'd like to brief, uh, I'd like to go through them uh, briefly. Um, Lynn Ball from the um, Oxy Ridge Neighbourhood Watch, many many years that she's spent with that organisation, uh, leading it and does a fantastic job. Uh, Joy Brown at the RSPCA Waco, uh, again a, a, a long a long time volunteer there, uh, who's. Uh, who just loves animals and uh, and can't speak uh, highly enough of them, of course, the dogs and the cats there, and, and some of the native animals as well. Um, Alfred uh, Bromwell, um, um, who uh, established a, a social uh, enterprise, uh, Divertextrix, um, who does uh, terrific work with uh, 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 the residents who uh, are looking for a bit of support for uh, uh, a bit of gardening and things like that, uh, or any other general uh, uh, maintenance uh, type of uh, uh, of problems or issues that they have, uh, and they do it all free of charge. Uh, Not Croft, um, who uh, has worked with the Anala Youth Service again for many, many years, uh, and Gloria uh, de Kevlin uh, from uh, the RSPCA at Wakel as well. Um, we also have a, uh, a lady by the name of uh, Dean uh, Clean, um, who um, is uh, the it works or volunteers with the Direct Anala Bulls Club. Uh, again, for uh, many, many years. Uh, most of these, of course, are volunteers. Uh, some of them are actually um, are actually paid um, uh, members of an NGO, but uh, they volunteer many, many hours past their uh, past what they get paid for. And uh, and I'm sure we all have those people in our areas, and we should always recognise that uh, that part of uh, that part of that service that they give to that organisation, which is above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, Terry Hill, who uh, volunteers for the uh, 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 the, um, uh, the elders of, uh, of Inala. Um, she's an Indigenous woman herself, a, a very young Indigenous woman who's getting on with her life, but she finds time to make sure that the elders have what they need to do their work in the, uh, in the ward. Les Josiah, um, the Inala um, Lions Club. Uh, and uh, he's the current president, has been for a couple of years now. And uh, again, he's uh, just a stalwart of the uh, Anala area and uh, always looks for those, um, those things that the community needs. Um, Les Kitchener, um, an indigenous man, uh, but uh, a very handy one and a very um, 
very artistic and uh, um, he can just work any, he can just, he just works with wood and he makes uh, toys for kids um, uh, with, through the uh, Forest Lake Men's Shed uh, where he does most of his work and he donates uh, uh, hundreds of toys each year to various uh, groups uh, who interact with uh, kids and uh, he just loves making those kids toys. Um, Owen uh, Lycom um, also uh, helps the, uh, a, a number of uh, youth within the, uh, within the ward um, and the electorate, of course, and uh, he, uh, he works closely with them and uh, especially the um, Samoan and Pacific Island Blind uh, kids, uh, but not just them exclusively. Um, we also have uh, Michael Ming, who's been a volunteer at the Inala Youth, uh, Youth Center for over 20 years. Um, he's, he's just the guy you can always count on to be there when you need him. Um, Alana No um, is the secretary of the Centenary Chamber of Commerce, but um, through, her, uh, through her work in real estate, she, she also reaches out uh, to other community groups to help where she can as well. Uh, Tran Nguyen um, from the uh, Vietnamese uh, community in Australia, the Queensland chapter, uh, has done uh, work for many, many years with that organization, along with uh, Yen Nguyen, um, who also, and, and of course, Q1, who's current uh, vice president of the, uh, of the chapter. Three uh, fantastic ladies that uh, really, um, you know, they all, they all have families, they all have to do all that uh, uh, work with their, with, their own, with their own families, of course, but find time to volunteer uh, a lot of their time uh, through the weeks and the months and the years uh, for the Vietnamese chapter. I just hope I have time to go through so I'll miss the rest of these. Um, uh, Carol, uh, Carol Palmer, who's the, um, the Anglican minister uh, at the, um, at the St. Hugh's Church, um, has spent uh, 20 years uh, um, undertaking her work. And uh, sadly, she's going to return to New Zealand. So we're gonna lose her out of the community over the next few months. Uh, but we wish her well. She's done some great work across the ditch. Um, Brian, uh, Brian Roach from the uh, Forest Lake uh, RSL sub-branch. He's been the treasurer uh, for the sub-branch for many, many years. And again, one of those guys that you can always count on to help you out if you've uh, got an issue or something that you want to do. Uh, Katrina Spencer, um, who runs Variety All-Stars, has been doing this work um, with uh, with the girls um, and, and guys uh, over the years. Um, they're, they're a dance troupe and, um, and uh, so, but she's volunteered uh, for many, many community events. Um, and that's what she was uh, recognized for, for those 20 years of uh, community carols that she helped put on. Uh, Vera Somerville, um, who is the Forest Lake uh, National Seniors uh, uh, lady who uh, also uh, sat uh, at, at a, at a, as an advisory uh, a in the National Advisory Seniors Group as well, uh, and has done that work for many, many years. Lisa Tittle, um, who um, is the Inala Youth Service um, uh, worker, youth worker, and she's been doing some fantastic work with, uh, uh, with the girls, uh, especially in, out of the youth service. Um, and uh, not to forget um, the uh, Lakers uh, Netball uh, Club, um, um, Mary, uh, and I'm probably not going to pronounce this exactly right, but Tiglidis. Um, and uh, I, I apologize, Mary, for not being able to pronounce your name. But honestly, Mary's been with the, the Lakers Netball Club. And she's really um, grown, helped grow that club to, to the point now that they've, uh, they're really needing some more courts up at CJ Greenfield. Um, I just wanted to uh, put on the record of, of those local heroes for 2020. 21, and uh, thank them very much on behalf of a grateful community who, um, who really appreciates what you've done. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers, Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I'd just like to add uh, my thanks to those of uh, the Deputy Mayor to uh, Andrea Kennefake, um, who will be retiring uh, very, very shortly. Uh, unlike the Deputy Mayor, I haven't known Andrea for very long, but what I would say in that short period of time, uh, what I've come to know is an extraordinarily 
professional executive, uh, one that gives frank and fearless advice and completely understands a vision of an administration. Um, I have enormous regard for her and on behalf of uh, Councillor Cunningham, uh, we'd like to wish Andrew all the very best in her retirement. First speaker is Councillor Mackay. Uh, thanks, Chair. I have it on very good authority that this is the last meeting before our esteemed colleague, Councillor Atwood, um, has her next child. So can we wish her easy feeds, long sleeps and lo lots of love in this very stressful time? <laughs> yeah. Councillor uh, Griffiths. Yes, uh, thanks, Mr Chair. I just want to um, uh, uh, speak on the Maruka Nathan Salisbury neighbourhood plan. Partly I want to respond uh, to Councillor Adams' commentary earlier today. Uh, I noticed uh, she talked about the Acacia Ridge neighbourhood plan. Um, and uh, she refuted, um, in fact, she was quite inaccurate in some of the comments she made. So I just want to put on the record that at that stage, uh, 10 years ago, the LMP were planning on rezoning parts of uh, Acacia Ridge or Archfield uh, to industrial areas. And I certainly worked with the local community down there to stop the LMP rezoning that land and maintaining those homes, those affordable homes and those homes that people were proud of um, so that they could keep them. Uh, it was a long fight, um, but eventually the LNP backed down and most importantly, it was one of the few back downs Campbell Newman had to do as well. So um, it actually wasn't a victory for Councillor Adams, it was a loss, uh, but it was a win for the community. It was also interesting in relation to the Maruka, Nathan and Salisbury draft plan that has just come out. Um, I'm concerned about the level of consultation so for the initial part of the consultation, only 30 people were included, um, not the whole community. Uh, I don't believe that's right. I believe if, you can, if you're consulting properly, you should include the whole community. Uh, my biggest concern with this plan, but at the moment, and I've checked this with two officers, one is a manager, is the uh, lack of protection of character houses in the areas that are being rezoned. I was out there today in a few of the streets and the um, the magnificent character homes that have been protected up until now um, by our city will, will not be protected under this plan and means that they're there for removal and demolition to make way for three or four storey or eight storey buildings. Um, I'm also concerned that residents don't understand the impact of density, be it parking, height or building uh, density on, on them. Significantly, Salisbury is going to see major change to, throughout the suburb. Uh, I believe people don't know that. And as well as that, I'm concerned about the industrial uh, land strategy that this administration will be bringing in, which I understand does include high-rise industrial areas. Um, and uh, I, I note that it's been virtually um, zero information in relation to that, but I understand that that is coming our way next few weeks. Um, in relation to consultation, I believe this council has been quite devious in the way it's done it. Uh, I note that it puts two of the consultation meetings on tomorrow when we have the Lord Mayor's budget. Um, so if you were having genuine consultation with the community and you wanted the local council there, you might and schedule a meeting on a day that the budget's being brought down. Um, similarly, I note that the whole process is occurring while we're in recess. So this will actually be the only formal council meeting that I get to speak about this plan during the consultation process. Once again, uh, I think it's devious and it's no wonder that the feedback people give me is they don't trust this council. And they don't trust it because they see what it's done in other areas of the city. Uh, further, I'm concerned about Nathan. Um, we have some industrial land there in residential zone and there's been no attempt to rezone that industrial land, despite an application that's currently before the courts for 800 units to be put on that industrial land. 800 units. Um, it's just obscene. Um, once again, uh, I think there's lack of planning for the elderly and diverse housing. I keep hearing about this housing strategy and we have for 10 months and nothing's happened. Uh, and finally, the the big point to make here is there's no planning for future infrastructure. There's no planning for more sports fields. There's no planning for more parks. There's no planning for the Maruka Bowls Club or other sporting facilities to be done up. There's no planning for Tui Forest. There is no planning. 
This plan is purely about density, increasing density. It's actually not, and it's, it's about development. It's not about looking after the community or looking after the, the genuine needs of the community. So I'm very disturbed by this plan. I'll be doing everything in the next um, four weeks to get the information out about this plan to constituents. And um, the early feeling and the early feedback I'm getting is that people are pretty unhappy with the way uh, Council has gone about this to date. Thank you. Further speakers? There being none, I declare the meeting closed. Can I also thank the clerks for their efforts and uh, look forward to seeing you all tomorrow.